400 we need some better lighting. Ladder My God. And forth. Yeah, given his previous basically uh, oh, wait. instincts for rain. Oh no, I didn't bring my lighting. Cool from nine, and there oh. it is. Wait, it's giving me oh, an ad. Just ad. like that, Brian. We lose time, uh, Ebony Kenny in fifth, and a massive round of applause from the rail. All right, what's going on, guys? We're here. We're live. Las Vegas, Nevada, GTO headquarters. Live and on air. Big Poppy, Joy Grimoire, and AK Shout Joy. Legion, the Legion, marching on strong there right now. Shout out to everybody in the Legion over on my Twitch channel right there. They're marching on. Joining me today, guys. Listen, before we get into it, though, I do got to shout out my sponsor, Manscaped. Use code Poppy. They gave me the bush. Listen, Ebony, I'm looking for sponsors. Some people are sponsored by ACR and Phil Nagy. Some people are out here... Sponsored by Manscaped. Manscaped, of course, provides the great experience for your, uh, your, I don't know, can women use Manscaped? Your nether, your nether, your nether region. I mean, can you imagine me with nice Manscaped and done? You know what I'm saying? Like GTO. So, you know, for me, great product for me to have. So that's why we promote Manscaped. Shout out to Manscaped. Use code Poppy. Let's go. Let's get it. Chats fired up. What's up, guys? We're here. We're live. Joining me today is a young woman. Listen, we've had her on the show. We've had her on the show a lot, guys. In fact, listen, check this out. First time she's on the show, July 8th, 2014. She's got this beautiful pink hair. Poker 2 podcast, it was called. I don't know what the fuck was going on in my time, I podcast back then. Second time she's on, she actually came to GTO Midwest headquarters in studio. Look at this, guys. She's got the purple hair now in my other studio. Great, great podcast studio. The, the origin studio. Then I ended up in her studio California studio, of course, that famous Luke Shorts podcast where Luke Shorts lost his fucking mind and called out everybody, and then Ebony had to put him in his place in the chat. And then, of course, a few years ago, Ebony Kenny, I want to be great at poker. Ebony's still grinding. She's still out here in the street. She's still working hard. And uh, she just got off one of her biggest scores ever in the Triton poker. People are asking, how'd you play the 200K? How'd you win $1.7 million? What are you going to do with the money? That people got a lot of questions. How'd you prepare? So we're gonna get into it today. Joining me today, a young lady, longtime poker player, one of the one of the most loved people in poker world. I feel like we got my girl Ebony Kenny in the house. The better, the better Kenny, maybe bring Kenny, Ebony Kenny. I don't know. Shout out to bring Kenny, but maybe. you know, maybe come on. Okay, come okay, on. okay, it's, okay. It's not even debatable at this point. So what's going? What's <laughs> going on, Ebs? How's it going? Nice to see you. Shout out to the chat. Yeah, thanks for having me. It this is. This is a wild, uh, wild, wild fucking thing. It feels so different than the past times that I've been on, and it's crazy. <laughs> I don't know. It's it's still settling in for me. It's a lot. So yeah. So you're out there playing the Triton Poker Series. You're out in the, the Cyprus in the Mediterranean Sea. A beautiful location. Yeah. Looks like a freaking castle out there. It seems like they went all out. So you went out there to play the 200K Coin Rib Invitational. Shout out to my man Rob Young for that great event and play the other events at the Triton Poker Series, like a 50K, a 25K. So what what's going on here? How the hell did you get out there? Last time we seen you, you were at World Series of Poker, streaming some Twitch, playing ACR, and now you're playing in front of tens of thousands of people for $5.5 million at the final table of the Triton Poker Series. Ebony, the people want to know. <laughs> <laughs> they said in there. Even it, saying that. Is her relationship with Phil Nagy help her get this get this opportunity? That's what, they've been, that's what they've been asking me, Evan. It turns out maybe, maybe you're sponsored by the site. Some of the sites, they give you a $10 ticket. Some of the sites give you 400K and buy-ins to play the series. So, Ebony, tell us, so, tell us more. So, I, I will say, first of all, just to everyone, like, anyone that's been anywhere at the top of anywhere uh, in any kind of, like, category didn't get there without, you know, the relationships that they have with people. Uh, I think it's like relationships and connections that get you into the room. What you do once you're in the room is up to you, right? So yeah, my relationship with ACR and Phil Nagy absolutely presented me this, with this opportunity, but I was not Phil's first choice. So many things <laughs> what? had to happen. You weren't? What do you mean? I was like, I was like his like five or like fifth or sixth choice. Five people turned five, down the opportunity to five go. Five people said no before me. Because of like one one he first the person he asked was his coach, and it was the same. Who's got a coach? Wait, Phil Nagy's got a coach? Yeah, you're he's kidding. Got a poker coach. No way, Phil Nagy. Okay, 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 okay. And uh, 
he said he couldn't because it was a wedding. It was the same weekend as his wedding. And he was like, oh, well, ask my fiance. The fiance agreed to push back the wedding. And, and Phil goes, no, no, no. Happy wife, happy life. I'm not getting involved with that. You enjoy your wedding. And, uh, you know, so then he asked a few other people. And for whatever reason, there were like scheduling conflicts or whatnot. So... You can't, what? Yeah. You can't clear the schedule? <laughs> Who are these guys? What are they, what's their conflict? I mean, to be... So, okay, so you get this opportunity. Phil Nagy, obviously, you're sponsored by ACR. ACR, I had great relationship. ACR over the years. Rocky relationship and up and down and a roller coaster and around. Shout out to the... So, Phil Nagy took the Russian bot money and decided to put some to the marketing budget. And he decided it'd be a good idea for him to go play this 200K event of course, he got the great coach, right? And he decided to bring on one of his his team members, and you got chosen to go out there. And then, so he says, hey, Ebony, you're going to go play 400K in buy-ins. What's going through your mind when you get an offer like that, opportunity like that? Because, you know, what what were you playing before? What was your normal grind compared to the kind of difference in, in events and skill level that this is? Yeah, I mean, I played a full schedule during the World Series. Uh, the, pa the past two World Series, obviously, you know, there was a break because of the pandemic. So I'll just speak on the past two. Uh, I played full schedules, but my average buy-in was $1,000, $1,500, you know, because uh, I was playing everything from 300 to 5Ks. Um, like, I just, I love tournament poker. So I was just out there grinding, you know, and I finally got my first cash in the main event and ran kind of deep in that, which was exciting for me. Um, but yeah, I play one, maybe two 10Ks a year. Um, and I play a few, probably like five to six 5Ks a year, but everything else is sub 5Ks. I am a mid stakes grinder. I'm not a, f well now, <laughs> I wasn't, uh, you know, somebody who played high stakes who had any experience and I definitely wasn't someone like I didn't think that there was anything like I didn't think that this was a place that I belonged mm. there was a lot of imposter syndrome and after he told me I was on my way to Joshua Tree after the World Series and there was like probably a couple of hours where I was like I need to call him back and tell him like no I don't deserve this I don't want to do it and to be honest obviously I'm so glad I didn't um but I just realized, like, if it's not me, then who? And I know what I'm good at, and that's being myself. So I was just going to take my energy and bring it to Triton. Yeah, so basically it seemed like you went out there, and then obviously you, you had to take it, your, your preparation, and you were taking it pretty seriously. I hope you get set up with one of my favorite coaches. Shout out to my guy, Chance. And she said, you're going out there, you hit me up. So wait, so you actually told me, I don't know if this, can you tell me if this is true or not? You said that Phil Nagy would have put me potentially in the Triton poker events. Did you say something like that? Is that, is that, is it, is it a true thing? That, that, well, that he pro he was open to putting you into some, like something. There were Phil Nagy, events. that would have been the greatest thing ever if, if Phil Nagy said, Poppy, listen, you know, we've had our rough times in the past, but I'm going to put Ebony in these events and, uh, I don't, know, I don't think I, I don't know if I could have said yes. I don't think I would have been able to say yes to that offer, but I'm glad that you said yes to this offer. So you go out there and you basically seem to rock it out there. You make a lot of great content. Everyone out there seems to really love you. You end up getting two scores, including in the 200K Invitational event for $5.5 million. We're going to get back to talking about your preparation here in a little bit because I know a lot of people out there are yeah. wondering about how you prepared for this moment, what have you been doing to work on your game and what have you been doing to study. So you get out there, you run deep in this 200K, first place $5.5 .5 million. I mean, that's freaking insane. And then you make the final table of this event. So talk about what's going through your mind when you're at the final table of this event and you know that you might win a $5.5 .5 million score and might actually win this event. Yeah, uh, <laughs> like honestly, so when, so I knocked out Tony G for us to get on the final table. And I just remember uh, turning to my friend Camille, shout out to Camille Brown, who is one of my best friends. And she's also a poker player. And Phil was very generous and let me bring both my kids and Camille as support out here. And so Camille was here every step of the way. And I just remember looking up at her and being like, oh my God. And then I looked at the payouts and I was like $620,000, which was insane. Like this was such an insane thing for me to be able to see 
as it directly relates to me because it hadn't been that for me, you know, for ever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, it, w it was just wild. And they paused. And we did this like really like elaborate intro and like where we went like behind the scenes and they had fog and smoke coming out and they did like these well-written intros. And it just felt so surreal because of the players. Like I was sitting in between Seth Davies and Fedor, like what is life right now? You mm -hmm. know, like two of the best players in the entire world. And then you've got Ebony Kenny in the mix and it just, it felt uh, for a large, um, for honestly for a lot of the week it felt very much like pinch me like I felt like I didn't belong here but every time I sat down I truly felt like I belonged there so it mm -hmm. was it was such a strange dichotomy for me to feel it was it was really it was really strange yeah yeah I mean that's one of the things right when you when you start playing those higher stakes against these certain names or these certain personas and auras it's always a tough thing you got to sort of get over to, to for me, right? That That's a big thing, right? When you're playing somebody like a Phil Galfond and you see Phil Galfond, you're like, oh my God, it's Phil Galfond. Like we, we all got the same choice of making decisions in these hands. So, you know, how much better are these players going to be than you in a situation like this? I mean, maybe, right? The variance just so high in some of these situations that maybe it doesn't matter because all kind of players can win these tournaments and it doesn't matter if you're the best player in the world or... If you're one of the worst players in the world, you still have a chance to make it to the final table to win because you can just yeah. run hot, you can get lucky. So, you know, I, I guess when you when you go there, when you experience that, is your takeaway that maybe you do have the skills to be able to hang in, in that sort of environment on a more regular basis? Or how has your thoughts about your own game and your own skill level and your own life maybe changed from having that experience uh, and competing with these guys and being able to actually have this great result for yourself? Yeah, I will say that from day one, uh, sitting down at the 25K, which was just eight or nine days ago, you know, was day one of the Triton event, of the first Triton event. Um, even I look back and I, I see like day one and like where I checked back, I had like five, six of spades. I missed like a, a gut shot and a flush draw and I just checked back six high, like on a board. Like I just have to bet. Like I know when I check back, I'm just conceding the pot. But there was like so much fear wrapped up wrapped up into it. And it's just like I know I think the difference between the, the good players, the great players and the elite players is being able to access the knowledge that they have and execute no matter what what the pressure feels like. And I got to really experience like the levels of like day one feeling like really scared. Like I know that I need to bet this hand. And I was just like, I'm scared. Right. Check. You know, like I was just scared shitless and it's like, for what, like why, you know? And I pride myself on not trying not to make decisions out of fear. And in that moment I did. And here I am eight days later and even talking with, with Camille and with Chance, I just, I know that my game has gotten exponentially better in the past eight days. And that's because I've been playing with the best of the best and they've put me in the fucking blender every chance they can. Mm -hmm. And I've had to make some really exhausting and tough decisions and it has been tough yeah. you know i i ran good in moments that i needed to but i definitely um i know what obviously i ran good on the bubble of the 200k but i know what prepared what propelled me to even get to the bubble was i had to make a very tough call for the majority of my stack with middle pair on the river and all in call against Sean Perry. And if I was wrong, I was left with six and a half big blinds and I used four or five time banks and made a call with middle pair and was just correct. And I would have been out and I just had to like go with my gut and trust myself. And so I think the thing that I've learned over the past week, the most about me is like, I'm not going to try to be Fedor, Seth, you know, I, I, can only be the best version of me, mm -hmm. and it worked out. Yeah, I so. think I think poker is about really trusting your intuition and trusting your preparation and trusting your experience and trusting what you know to be a winning strategy, and then putting it out there and not wondering if you know should I be playing like this guy or should I be playing like that guy or this guy's really aggressive or this guy's more passive or you know what I mean? Like just kind of going. And now it's it's never been easier to do that because I mean I'm studying every poker every single day now and. Uh, it's never been easier. It's basically, you play against the RTA, right? You're playing against the dream machine that's telling you what to do. 
and I play hours a day against this thing. So I'm basically <laughs> like, oh my God, this is the most craziest thing. And then you actually go play against real people and you're like, oh wait, I know, I know exactly what to do in this spot. So now like Doug Polk always just talk about it's a memorization game in, in a lot of ways to sort of memorize what to do in some of these situations and then trusting that instinct. Whereas in, in a lot of people who don't study or are trying to memorize their results, they're sort of going off their feel and their pattern recognition and, and kind of combining that as well. But a lot of people are probably scared to make certain plays or go with their gut or trust that their belief in, in what they know to be the right play in that situation. And I'm sure that is something that holds a lot of people back. So it sounds like you're saying that that's something that you feel like you got over the hump at during this event. Then moving forward, you may be able to even be, be a real stronger player just from having this, this short experience. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the Triton series, albeit it's only, you know, nine days, it is an aggressive nine days. Mm -hmm. And I played half a million in buy-ins in not nine days, which is such a wild thing for me to say. Like, I every time I would buy in for one of these tournaments, I would have like a mini heart attack. Like I'm like, basically, I, I had a, a, like I hyperventilated a little bit right before the 200K. Like I was in my robe, I was getting my, I was doing my makeup and I was completely ready except I hadn't gotten dressed yet. And the minute I put my dress on, I started freaking the fuck out. Like I was like, <gasps> Like literally, I right. was like, "Oh my God, this is intense!" And mm -hmm. I think, I and I've been like pretty vulnerable about my experience the whole time. I posted on Instagram and you know, just, like posted like a selfie of me crying, saying like, "Just had my second mini meltdown of the trip," and it's the day before the 200k, and mm. it's yes, this is a, an ex this was and it will forever be an extremely amazing, amazing opportunity that I'm so grateful for. And it was intense and it was overwhelming. And there was a, there were so many times like the day of 200 K I was like, I just want to go home. I don't want to play this. Mm. Like I was, I was that, I was freaking out that much. And you're freaking out because of the players you got to play against or just the stakes of the moment or what it might mean for your future, your life or sort of a combination of it's, all those things. It's really the stakes. Cause at that point I had already been playing the entire week with the players. Mm -hmm. So this wasn't anything new. If anything, it was going to be a little slight. The first day was not going to be softer for sure, because the first day I was only with pros and the rest of the events I've been playing, it's been mingled with, you know, pros and businessmen. Um, so I knew that the day one was going to be the toughest poker that I've played in my life, hands down. Um, but to be honest, it was just the $200,000 that's yeah. at the time before I came to Triton, that buy-in was a, roughly equivalent to half of my lifetime tournament earnings. Like that's an absurd number, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty, pretty crazy of a thing to be able to go to that moment and play for that amount of money. And I guess when you get in the moment, you calm yourself down. How do you calm yourself down? Because I know that you're big into mindset. Obviously, we talk a lot about spirituality. We talk a lot about mental game. We talk a lot about different practices and exercises that you can do to get yourself in a GTO mindset, be ready to crush and, and be feeling good about your game and, and be feeling like your best self and be feeling like you got yeah. every you got every tool needed to succeed in this situation. Yeah, I mean, I immediately hired Jason Sue. Uh, who is a shout out to Jason. He is a phenomenal mindset coach who is perfect for me and really helped me kind of process everything that was happening leading up to being out here. Mm -hmm. And I would talk to him during breaks, uh, you know, and, and talk to him. Like I talked to him right before the final table of the, of the 25 K and it's just, what, what, what did he say? What, what did he tell you to do in that situation? Right. So he, you're he hyperventilating. Talked, you're you're locked down. down. Right. You're like, ah, I can't. How am I going to how am I going to get out of this room? So what what do you what's going through your mind in that moment? Because a lot of people get in that moment. They get there and they're like they hit that wall and they go, fuck, how the fuck am I going to overcome this obstacle right now in this moment and put in my best result and really make this moment count? A lot of people face that decision in a lot of things that they do with their life. So what did you do in that moment to get yourself? present back in moment and out of your head yeah uh so what's really interesting is that when i first sat down to play the 25k i was scared shitless and i literally just sat down and i told the table that i was scared shitless 
I was like, I don't know how you guys do this. This is wild. Like, this is a casual 25K, no big deal. And being able to let that out and just share that, like, I'm the type of person I don't like to hold anything in. And being able to share that really helped me release some of that energy that I was like pent up inside me. Mm -hmm. Um, and so what was really interesting about the entire experience for me is that while I was playing, I was very calm, even like watching back, I've watched a little bit of the final table and like watched a couple hands and like watching myself, it feels almost like an outer body experience because I was so calm during hands. Like I didn't react. Like I was just, very zen but the minute we would go on break i'd be like oh my fucking god and i would be like what the fuck is happening like it was like i was two different people mm -hmm. i would go in the bathroom and i'm like screaming and like shouting or i would go on breaks and i'm like skipping in the grass on the phone with jason you know it was just for whatever reason there was just two versions of me that showed up and the version of me that showed up when I played was the one that needed to and was in and capable of full control and just focused on what I needed to do. And then the version of me that as soon as we went on break, I just was like, what the fuck is happening? Mm -hmm. It was like taking the entire moment in. So yeah, it was, I don't know. It was wild. It's, this whole thing is still crazy for me. Yeah, a lot of people on Twitter said that your calm demeanor at the table. I mean, you were, you look pretty locked in. You look you look like you've been there before. You look like a pro. I think if a lot of people didn't know that about you, they wouldn't know that you were feeling this way. Especially, you always come off as a very confident woman. I mean, I know you as one of those confident people. I know, right? You got a special aura, a special personality about you. I I never really seen it with anybody else in terms of when you're talking to people or how you carry yourself or how you think about yourself or even the uh, you know. I feel like for you, the thing that I've noticed that has been the thing to maybe. Uh, you know, I would say hold back in some ways for, for both of us is that having that fear of like, okay, I've had success here, but like, can I really do this? Can I really achieve yeah. this thing that seems otherworldly to me that very few people go through? So it's not like this common experience that you look around and say, okay, everyone in my life, I see all these people doing it. It's so easy to do it. I know I can do it because they can do it, but trying to achieve things that you don't necessarily see other people around you achieving can really hurt your vision for a lot of these things. And I think that can hold a lot of us back. I feel like for yourself, you know, you never really let yourself believe that that was even a possibility in some ways. So maybe even getting to that point, you've never really mentally prepared yourself to be in that moment to say like, okay, well, now I'm here. Like, is this like, what does this mean in the grand scheme of things? Cause we can get in our head so much and just mind fuck ourselves yeah. in that moment. I mean, that's exactly like you hit the nail on the head. And obviously it's cause you and I know each other so well, and we've had so many conversations about this, especially over the past like year. Um, but it, it really is, I, as a poker player, I never, like you watch Triton on TV, right? You watch these high stakes tournaments and these high stakes games and you see the best of the best of the best. I never imagined that I would be sitting and playing and not only playing, but like making a run in these events. Mm -hmm. I didn't dare. And I use the word dare intentionally because I didn't dare to dream that I could do that because it just didn't seem like you don't see women, you don't see, I, I'm a black queer woman. You don't see, you don't see a lot of those people that tick those boxes doing those things. So I didn't have anything to reference any of that to like, I couldn't visualize it. And for a lot of people being able to see something helps you believe it. Like if right. you're saying, if you can see it, you can believe it. That's a real thing. Right. And so I had kind of conceded my career to being like, okay, like I'm just going to be a mid stakes grinder. I'm fine. Like, you know, I can hopefully I'll run deep in the main one day and whatever, but I didn't have any of these, any of these like grand ideas about playing high stakes poker. Mm -hmm. And then when I got out here and I sat down and I was chip lead for the majority of the day of the 25 K, I couldn't believe it. I was like, these are the best players in the world and I am chip leader and like, yes, fish can, can, you know, bag the chip lead. Yes. Fish can win tournaments. Who gives a fuck? The fact of the matter is that I consistently in every tournament I played, not every one, but two, I was chip leader for a large portion of the tournament. And it, that's wild for me. Mm -hmm. That's wild. Mm -hmm. So I, I can, um, <sighs> 
Yeah, I just, I didn't, I never thought, I never imagined anything like that. And saying it, it feels like I'm not talking about myself. I mean, it's kind of like, like the, I'm talking the, about someone else. Right. I mean, that that's the great thing about, I mean, that's like the poker dream in, in a lot of ways is to experience these moments that you're experiencing when, when certain people have that dream, right? I always dream of getting to the high stakes or playing high stakes online or playing against the best players in the world. So that was always my dream when I first started ever playing poker. I was like, I'm going to fucking, I want to. I want to find Tom Dwan. I want to play this guy. I want to play all these guys. I'm playing. I want to challenge everybody I could challenge. And, uh, but a lot of people I've worked with in the past, they ne don't necessarily get to that point. They like get stuck in mid stakes. They go, oh my God, I can't like get past two, four. I'm like, bro, your two, four graph goes up for three years, right? Like you can you, be fine, but they can't get past. Yeah. They got this mental barrier, this limited belief that they put on themselves for their own skill, for how much money they can make, for what kind of players they could beat, for the kind of, you know, a bunch of different things. Like I said, think more about it. I haven't thought about this in a while. And it sounds like you're breaking through those beliefs right now by having this experience. And then also by working with the coaches that you have, you mentioned that you're working with uh, Jason, who I've seen, I don't know him at all, except on Twitter. I really like his threads. I like the way he shares his insight. So maybe talk a little bit about how he helped you in uh, this moment or this series or in general for your own poker game right now. Yeah, um, Jason, actually, I went to... Mexico like a couple weeks after I found out uh, that I was playing the Triton 200k and mind you when I found out I was playing the Triton 200k I didn't there was no plans in place for me to play the entire schedule it was just like I'm playing the 200k that's it um, so I had gone to Mexico with a group of friends and then I had made day two of the Venom so I extended my stay and streamed the Venom while I was in Mexico and I ran deep Venom and was very happy with that. And the day after, I had a call with Jason. And he said something that day that really shifted so much of how I felt about myself internally. Uh, because I'm really proud of the work that I've done, like the, the growth and the leaps and bounds I've made as a human. And the, uh, the intention that I put behind being a good human and how I show up with people and how I show up for myself and for my kids and, and X, Y, Z. Uh, but he said something to me that day where he was just like, you just as yourself, you are good enough. You're worthy of being proud of yourself without it being attached to because of the growth, because of the work, mm -hmm. just you alone are good enough to be proud of yourself. And that like hit home so much because it felt like in order for me to be proud of myself, I had to qualify it with how far I've come. Mm -hmm. And I just realized, I was like, holy shit. And like, I cry every single coaching call with Jason. And it's just a really raw, vulnerable space. And he just pulls out so much emotion from me. And I'm already, you know, a very emotional person. Mm -hmm. So definitely, he has this way of like finding, like finding and kind of just like turning and unlocking more vulnerability, more power, more strength and helping you see the best parts of yourself without qualifying it, without needing to justify loving yourself and thinking that you're worthy of being loved, which is something I try to do with the people in my life. And I hadn't had someone do that for me probably ever really, mm -hmm. you know, and not have someone do it with intention and someone I like, was like, okay, seeking this out and I'm officially hiring this person, I'm giving them money to work with them and I'm going to do an actual exchange. And this was the first time that I worked with someone like that. And I, I realized like how powerful it is and how cathartic it's been for me and how healing it's been for me, which I think is a big part of why I was able to achieve what I've done in the past week is because I believed I could. Yeah, I mean, we talk about this a lot, Ebony. Obviously, when I was away from poker, I was only studying this stuff. So I was basically studying subconscious, subconscious reprogramming strategies and ideas because I felt like the foundation of my life was just like broken at that time. I didn't, yeah. I didn't just, I just couldn't think in a way that, that just didn't make any sense. I'm like, what the fuck am I even doing anything for in my life? It doesn't make any sense. And a lot of those things is, is what I need to do. I need to reprogram the beliefs that I put on myself, the limited beliefs that I imposed on myself or what my life is or what my life could be or who I could be as a person or in every area of my life, friends, family, loved ones, diet, money, poker, content, friendship, family, all these kind of things. So I just kind of dove deep in the lab and you're one of the people I often talk to about the idea of we get what we expect to get and what we believe to be true 
is what's going to yeah. take place in our life. And if we expect ourselves to get to a certain point, then we're going to get to that certain point. And uh, the ideas and strategies that you can use to expand and pass that limited belief area that you impose on yourself takes a lot of courage and uh, the ability to get rid of the fear that we have in ourselves of for a number of different reasons, whether we're not deserving enough or whether we're not worthy enough or whether we think that it's too hard or we think that people that look like us or feel like us or be like us don't do that. So it yeah. sounds like you are going through this big transformation with your life now. And uh, it sounds like this trip may have come as a result of that in some ways, right? This opportunity comes as a result of that. I mean, right place, right time, you know, lucky scenario, five people turn it down. You happen to be working with this crazy fucking guy, Phil Nagy. This is a different <laughs> kind of guy. I don't know, right? A lot of people out there, they're fired up about it. And, uh, you know, maybe it's not a coincidence, I guess. I don't, I don't necessarily believe in the, in the coincidences. Yeah, I, I will say that our, our talks were some of my favorite talks that I had. And I realized I'm like, man, this is like weird for some people. And I don't have a lot of people in my life that I can have these kind of conversations with. And the shit that we would talk about was just every time I would come home, I'm like, man, I want wine and popcorn night with Joey. Like, <laughs> I mean, like, it was so great. And I was like, I miss these conversations and I was always so fired up and just like, I felt like I was able to see possibilities within possibilities and really believe that these things were happening. And it, I mean, it really is true. Like whatever you, whatever you think you're going to accomplish, you're right. Period. Like whatever, you, if you think you can't do it or you think you can, you're, you're hundred percent right. And it doesn't mean that you're going to accomplish it the first time. But if you just keep trying and you and you focus on the process, not the end result, you're it's going to work out. And and thinking like, whoa, it's me, like for a long time poker player, like I just was always so stuck on the result. And I was always like, Oh, this person got so lucky and I would say like I'm a better poker player than them or whatever. But the fact of the matter is that if I was like really taking a deep look at myself, was I actually doing the fucking work? Right? Instead of comparing the comparing myself to somebody who didn't do the work and got lucky. I was like, why can't I not do the work and get lucky? You know, like that's what do you mean by work? What, when you when you say through. when you say work, I have heard people say that they say like the work is that some more internal like, sort I, of. I mean, in, in reference to like basically anything that I've wanted in life, mm -hmm. I I have always I have a natural skill set and I'm able to like get pretty good at something initially, like without much effort. Agree. Very, you're and very good at that. I would, I am very good at that, and I have leaned on that a lot and not done the work to improve because I've just been good enough to be in the middle of the pack without doing any of the work, without putting any effort in, and that's been enough for me. And then I would look at other people who were maybe less talented than me, who got lucky or who did the work, and I would get, I would be like, Ugh, what? And I would have some sense of entitlement, like, no. Instead of, I would look at what their journey was and their path was, and project like my jealousy, my insecurities, my entitlement onto that instead of just thinking about like, okay, Ebony, well, are you actually doing the work? Like, because at the end of the day, it's the process that's gonna get me there. Yes, I. it takes luck. Yes, it takes prep, like it takes certain things, right? And timing. But if you're not ready when an opportunity presents itself, it's just, there's so many opportunities I've been presented with in the past that I just let slip out of my fingers because mm -hmm. of me getting in my own way because I wasn't ready to do the fucking work in whatever capacity that was, whether that was with poker, whether that was with modeling, whether that was with hosting. I got so many opportunities with so many gigs and I just let them slide out of my fingers because I just was like, oh, I'm good enough to just show up and just I prepare. And that's such bullshit. And I wanted to do, do it differently this time. Mm -hmm. So you go out there and you're 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 getting this offer. So a lot of people listen. We 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 hit the we hit the we hit the lead, right? This is what we want to know, Poppy. Come on, how much <laughs> of this do you get to take home? Come on, are you gonna share it with the fans or what? Come on, we all want to know. Are you are no. you are you are you taking home 1.7 million? How much did you win out of this experience? People want to I mean, know. First of all, we all know we all know I'm not taking home 1.7 million. Okay, no, okay, okay, not, okay, like, okay. Let's 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 not be. Come on, we all want to know, <laughs> Ebony. <laughs> Um, I, I let us, I let us talk for 30. You know, I got the fire. I got the gut, the question ready to go. Everybody, everybody yeah. asked me that. What, what did, how I, much did I Phil Nagy you know get? Here's, here's, here's what I want to, I want to talk about as it directly relates to this, this entitlement that people have 
uh, with wanting to know. They're like, oh, like, I think that I saw someone on Twitter that said, like, oh, like, what's this thing? Like, why is it so shady that nobody knows it got into this 200K? And it's like, why is it shady just because you don't have the information? Like, you aren't, you, do you know what how much Jason Kuhn has, Seth Davies, Fedor? Like, do you know, like, is there like this spreadsheet that's going around that everyone has clear information on? That's a contract that poker players sign that says, Hey, because you play this, we all get to know. No, there's not. And there's like this aggressive entitlement that is attached to whenever a woman has a big score, the kind of mm. the, the way questions are formed and the way that demands are made against women in this industry is such bullshit. And it's such an aggressive double standard. And I like, no, I'm not telling anybody shit and you don't, you don't have to know just in the, this idea that like, Oh, you're going on a public podcast and I have to like, I have a right to know, like, you don't have a right to know shit. You have a right to sit here and watch whatever you want. I get to choose to be on this podcast. I choose to share what I want. I'm choosing to keep this to myself. Mm -hmm. So well, to be fair, <laughs> to be fair to the question, I would, I've asked, I ask everybody that question that if they have a big score, no, I go, I, go, I'm not, I'm I think not, it's, I'm I think it's pretty standard. You. I think it's like standard no, men or women, 100%. right? Like anyone, I want to know that you won five, uh, five mil Fader, come on here. I always ask Fader, you got a big piece. What's, what's happening with this fade? Oh, I know. I know. I already know the answer to the question. question. No, I know. I already know the answer I'm to the talking, question. You know, but I'm talking <laughs> about the way that the casual poker fan, fan responds because poker players don't feel entitled to know. Mm -hmm. Poker players are like, oh, that's your business. Right. Poker fans feel a sense of entitlement. And then I've seen like bitter buddies, and not men, not women specifically, bitter buddies okay. like on social media who are like, oh, she didn't win 1.7 million because she didn't have X, Y, Z percent of herself. And it's just like, okay, so when an actor gets paid 10 million to be in a movie, he's got agents, he's got this, he's got that. But you don't say, oh, he didn't get paid 10 million. When an athlete signs a you know multi-million dollar contract, you don't say, oh, he didn't get that because he's got to pay his people. Bitch, I'm paying my people, who cares? Who cares? So. <laughs> Mike, Mike. Oh, yes. And someone said the, the Triton live chat was nasty towards her. That part. That part. Mm. The way the way that chat talks to women and talks about women while they're playing on Ames is disgusting. And they, mm. they have to do better. Period. Yeah. I mean, these guys in the chat. I mean, listen, shout out to my chat. My chat got a lot of inline guys. Now I see my girl Sam Abernathy out there, the queen herself, hey. Sam Abernathy, aye, 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 aye. Sam Abernathy, <laughs> you remember Sam Abernathy, Ebony, aye, 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 cola, mosa, mamacita, aye, <laughs> aye, aye, Sam Abernathy, aye, 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 shout out to Sam, my man eating the rocks in the chat, we got Keisha out there, I saw Summer, Joel Bradenberg, what's up guys, Teddy, David Stewart, where are you guys at, where are you guys watching from, what's going on, Hex Live, Keisha. you said you've been watching us, Hex Live said they've been watching us for a decade, Ebony, 10 years strong, people have been tuning in, to see what the hell you're up to, what the hell people are up to. <laughs> so, okay, so you you have no answer to that question, right? We don't know, you could be a millionaire, you could not be a millionaire. All we do know is that you did well and you presented a nice ROI for your employer, ACR and Phil Nagy as the investor. And by the way, let's talk about that a little bit. So it's pretty common for most players to have investors in, in their business, in poker. Correct. And I mean, in most businesses, mm -hmm. like you, you, that's all, it's mainly what I'm focusing on now is early stage investing, kind of early stage investing theory, how to think about all that kind of stuff. So a lot of right. people in poker are running their operation like this. Some of these guys don't even got any money. And you think that they're the high stakes players. Like, I mean, none of this stuff is what it seems. I don't know if people, like none of this stuff is what it seems. I, I cannot stress this stuff enough. Everything yeah, that you probably I think, think is I not, think is not, you know, you know what I mean? Yeah, I think that's why, it's like why I get so frustrated because it's not about like, oh, like everybody gets asked this question. It's like, I get it. It's about with like this visceral entitlement that people are asking with me and these demands, right? And and this idea that like, because I don't normally play these, I now am like obligated to share that there's that, like that's like, who cares? Okay, yeah, I... but then also like, what you like the fact that you think that what you're actually watching on TV is just reality that you don't know, like that the people aren't making deals behind the scenes and swapping and buying and this and that, like this is a different world. And I got to play in this league for nine days 
I got to bear witness to a lot of conversations, to a lot of stuff that was had. Like, this shit is wild. It's fucking crazy. And I'm like, okay. Perception is reality for the folks at home. And that's all that matters. Yeah. It's a good way to put it, Ebony. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a different world, different language, different thought processes, different motivations. And then obviously this gets into the, now you can understand a lot of my past podcasts have focused on this community specifically, which is the high stakes community and all the out of line shenanigans that happen in this out of line community, because once you're buying in for 200,000, it's a different experience. So your desire and your incentive for some people is higher. And that's where the shenanigans start to take place. And now this really bleeds into the one of the biggest problems in poker was in that situation. But that's another topic for another time. We got the chats <laughs> fired up. They're saying they're from all over. Jack said, I think people are interested in the deal you made and how it was made because the teams are interesting because you don't play many tournaments this big and others want to copy this path, which is a good point because a lot of people would like to potentially do that in the future with a businessman yeah. who wants to play. Maybe they want to put you in as the professional player. So the format for this event, if you guys don't know, it was a business. I mean, by the way, this is the greatest hustle of I've ever heard of, okay? Get this guys. So the way, okay, typically you get all the best players in the world in the event. The bad player, why would the bad player really wanna play? The bad players wanna play with all the best players or swap it action. Who really knows what's happening? They could literally be, you know, one guy, who knows, right? So what they did in this day is they go, oh, you know what, tell you what. You can play, the businessman can play, but you get to play with just the businessman. You being a professional, professionals play with each other on day one. So yeah. everyone feel good about themselves. Ha ha, ace nine off limp under the gun, whatever, five X raises, who knows what's going on in, these, in this businessman game. Then they combine for day two and then the professionals just fucking crush them. So it's this great, one of the greatest hustles, honestly, I've ever seen to, uh, set something like this up to get all these recreational players in the game is great. I mean, when I say hustle, I mean, listen, great job, makes them feel comfortable. They feel comfortable playing. Do they have more of a realistic chance of winning? You know, we can very much debate that. And, and uh, you know, so should they not be playing the event? Most likely not, but you guys know how these things go. That's what's great about poker. This, this, so I, I, I wanted, I want to challenge that this idea that, that people should or shouldn't be playing certain events. Okay. Like it's bullshit. The, this who who's to say who should or shouldn't be playing because the fact of the matter is there were a multitude of people that said i shouldn't have that phil was literally lighting two hundred thousand on fire true exactly another great so point this i this idea that people should or shouldn't be playing is like is there is there this great god of, of like panel that decides like allowed to play like if you have the money you play I think, I think the market has decided that. The market, they, they're they not making enough money or for whatever reason. I mean, it depends on where the games are at. If they're in Vegas, there's a few fun players, right? They kind of rotate in between. They come yeah, more. It depends field, on... The field that played this event, mm -hmm. none of them live... Like, all of the, the businessmen side, like, a lot of them live in, like, Dubai. Mm -hmm. They live in, in, in the UK. They, they don't live in Vegas, you know? Like, a couple do. But for the most part, these are very, very wealthy individuals mm -hmm. who love the game of poker, mm -hmm. who their their heart doesn't start pumping until there's lots of zeros behind a certain number. And this is this is what they need to, to make it fun. So this idea that they should or shouldn't be playing, it's like, it's also like they want a challenge. They want to sit down with the best. They don't want to sit down with the like 20 of the worst players who can all afford to play. Like, oh, now I'm the best of the worst? Mm -hmm. No, I want to sit with the best and I want a chance to like prove myself and I like challenges. And it's like, you don't make a billion dollars without fucking putting yourself in hard situations and like taking chances and taking risks. That's what all of these businessmen do. So why should they not play with the best of the best? Sure, if that's what they want to do, I, I, I makes sense, right? I'm, I, I would agree, right? Listen, anytime we can advocate as, as a high stakes player, I, a hundred, you should always go play, right? Of course, I agree. You always got a chance to win, right? I agree, I agree. Listen, go ahead, I mean, look, go I'm, get in the mix of the I'm best not, players. You should do it. I'm not, I'm not a high stakes player and I played seven tournaments this week. Uh -huh. I final tabled three, I bubbled two. But you, you kind of a pro, you are a professional time. though. You're not an amateur, you're a professional. Yeah, but not in this league. This is a different world. 
I don't know. I mean, I'd like to. I don't know. I'd like to. This is what I don't. I I don't know. Maybe I want to see you play with these guys. Maybe maybe not. Maybe we'll find out. I don't know. Maybe you learn. Feel like you learn fast, right? Like maybe you put your yeah. mind to it. You can. You know what I'm saying? Like I don't know. I I I I see what you're saying about the other players, right? But I mean, for yourself, I guess in this situation, are you going to be playing more Triton? I know. Uh, are there more plans for you to represent uh, your company and to play in these events in the future? I mean, I. I really hope so. Um, I really, first of all, I just want to say like, shout out to Phil Nagy for giving me a chance. This is like the most, it was, this entire experience is just his crazy idea. He is a madman and this crazy genius idea that just worked out in the way that it did is beyond anything that I could have imagined 90 years ago. And now here I am, it's still, it's still, it still hits me in waves, right? Like even before this call, like I was having dinner with Neil and our servers, they play like in the casino here, they have these huge screens and they're playing the Triton series the whole week. So, and it's all over the casino. So we went to dinner in the in the restaurant in the casino and the when we walk in, they're like, oh, welcome Ebony. They're just like saying me by my name now. And they make a cappuccino and on it, they wrote in the words, good luck. And just this simple thing, like I literally started crying. I'm just like so grateful for like these simple, like <laughs> loving gestures. I'm also like We're used to America. still. Yeah. I'm still Damn. like, I'm still processing this shit, you know, like 1.7 million is absurd. But then on top of that, like 240,000, like I am just $60,000 shy of having $2 million scores in a week mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that's that's insane like i've been playing poker for 20 years and i had four hundred thirty thousand in, in scores like two million in a week is, is a lot so i just like shout out to phil for for letting me be able to for giving me the opportunity to experience this and letting me get here as myself and he didn't try to make me do anything like he didn't try to make me become a different player he was just like do you, we had plans to like talk poker when I got here and he was just like, uh, we played the 25 K and then I finally, like I made day two and he was like, I'm just going to let you do you. Like you got here on your own. Uh, and then when I fabled and I got fifth, he was just like, okay, I'm not going to talk poker with you at all this week. Like <laughs> just, just you, just do you mm -hmm. Try, like, you know, just, you know, and it was just nice. Like he gave me space to, to be me. And I think, for me personally, like as a, as a woman who got to experience this, as a woman, like as a mid stakes player who doesn't play high stakes and as a woman in a male dominated field, my goal now is I want to bring more women to experience this. I want to want more players like me to experience this. Mm -hmm. So I am doing everything I can now. Like I'm, I'm thinking outside of the box of like, okay, how, how can I kick the door down and bring more of us? to experience this because mm -hmm. I think it's only fair. Well, you don't, you're not going to experience that in America because America, they don't, they treat, they basically slap you in the face and they welcome you to the casino. <laughs> Bam, hit you in the side of the head. There, they're writing good luck. <laughs> they're comping things. They're taking care of you. They're treating you nice. I'm used to the United States American poker world where they, they, ah, uh, this fucking guy's here. Okay, fine. You know what I mean? It's like they huff and puff. It's like they, ah. Uh, they gotta put the coat on again, you know, get to work for the 15th year straight. Whereas it sounds like these people over there really knew how to make you feel special, take care of you. And it sounds like that really added to the experience of the Triton poker world. And it sounds like you had a phenomenal time over there, not just playing poker, but interacting with the poker world, interacting with the people that work as the players that are working in the community that are helping putting on the events. So talk about who were some of the people that you met or reached out to you that you couldn't believe that you were talking to these people now. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's actually fucking crazy. Um, so I had reached out to Seth Davies uh, a few months before the World Series, uh, reached out to him about coaching and he was like, I'm not taking on any clients right now, uh, but I'll keep you in mind if I do. And then when it was announced, he like reached out to me and was like, hey, uh, congrats, I'm playing 200K. If you want to, you know, do like an hour or two coaching, you know, I, I would love to help you. Like he offered that for free and then our schedules couldn't really quite work out. So that never happened. But 
throughout the entire week. Like he was so supportive. Like he came up to me during the 25 K introduced himself because we had never met in person. And then was just like, he like, he was like, are you getting sun every day? And it was just this simple reminder where I was like, Oh my God, I'm just not. And he was like, yeah, go get sun. Super important. And he's like, make sure you're drinking enough water. And it's just these reminders that like, I know to do these things, but it was nice to have like a reminder from someone who knows what the fuck he's doing just be like, this is really important because you got a long week ahead of you, you know? And then Jason Kuhn gave me some sick fucking advice um, on the, uh, towards the money bubble of the 200K after he busted. Like I just saw him, I was walking out, saw him in dinner break and he just came up to me and was like, okay, here, do this, do this, do this. Don't do this, don't do this. And he's like, good luck. I'm like, what the fuck just happened? It was like wild. And then... 30 minutes after he busted, Phil Ivey sent me a message on Instagram telling me good luck. And I'm like, what the fuck is happening? Like, what is my life? Phil Ivey. <laughs> yeah, come on. This is, is wild. So. Yeah, it sounds like you definitely took it full advantage of the opportunity out there. That's awesome. Yeah, it was honestly, everyone was so nice. Everybody was so nice at the tables. And I will say the difference in the the vibe at the table here versus the rest of poker energy when you sit down and play is that I'm sure there are a lot of players in here that don't get along, but you would never know. Like I'm an outsider coming in and everyone was so nice and so respectful. There was no like, there was like joking around and whatever, but they just didn't like they weren't fucking weird to each other. They weren't rude to each other. They were polite. They were they were kind. They were joking, laughing, having a good time. There was just oh, none of this like negative, nasty, childish behavior. You know, like they were like, hey, like we're in public. We're gonna play nice. You know, and it's just like I just I would never know if somebody hated someone else. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the way. That's the kind of energy. Uh, and the tone that needs to be brought into poker instead of all of this like petty behavior and this like good old boys club mentality. It's such bullshit. <laughs> Sounds like a dream world you're living in, Ebs. I like it. I like it. Everyone's <laughs> nice. Everyone hand, Everyone shakes each other's hand and pats them on the back and is very respectful to each other. And uh, of course, yeah, it sounds great. I, w I mean, that sounds like a phenomenal place to be. Well, and the thing is, is like no one was being fake. Like you could tell, like, no one was like going out of their way to like say okay, hi. But, okay, 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 okay. These guys are professionals, by the way. So the job is to be fake. So when you're a professional listen, at listen, the highest I, level. Listen to me, I, I'm an expert. At oh my God, get what out I, of here. What I mean, what I mean, let me finish, is the way that somebody said hi to somebody was not the way they said hi to everybody. What I'm saying is that they would walk up and say hi to people and they would just like, like if they would come over and like hug someone or like give them a pat on the back, they would acknowledge. There wasn't, there wasn't like this, this nasty tension. And like, for whatever reason, in other like poker environments that I've been in, if I've been on a table with somebody that doesn't like me, there's so much tension. And it's just like, grow the fuck up. Like, mm -hmm. since when, what, thank you for giving me your power, I guess, like, that I like me just being on the same table with you affects you in a way that you can't even, you know, be an adult and like say thank you when someone does something or when I say thank you, you can't say like you're welcome or, you know, even just say two words without deciding you're going to be a dick. These things that happen in poker now and it's just like be professional, you know? Well, like, I mean, well, well, let me let me think about that for a second. So maybe you just don't know. It sounds like you don't know these people. They don't have a reason to hate, dislike you, I guess, then. Whereas Wait, some of the other what? people, I mean, if I dislike someone at the poker table and I'm playing with them, like, I don't know. I'm, 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 I mean, you're saying professional, like, be cheery and nice and smile to them or something like that? I'm or? not, there's a difference between being cheery and nice, right? Like, you can be cordial. Uh huh. Right? They're, like, cordial is always the way. Just because you're cordial doesn't mean you're being fake. Like, okay. because when you, when you choose to be like negative and petty and bring like your outside shit into the, now you're bringing everyone else into your shit. And that's selfish. Like, if I don't like you and there's seven other people playing in this, in this poker tournament, mm -hmm. why do I need to bring those seven other people into it? Mm -hmm. You know, like, what is this? We're not in the fucking sandbox and like, oh, she, she touched me mm -hmm. or stay on your side. Like, grow the fuck up. Hmm. 
I can see that, yeah. I can see that. Eric Holler said, Joey, don't be so cynical. We need optimism in poker and everybody's dealing it out. I, li I listen, I like the... I love I love the optimism. <laughs> I see the optimistic side of things too. I just see I see other sides as well. I mean, I no, I, think I think these I, think you've I don't think these are negative. solutions. What what is the solution? The solution is I you're advocating for people that treat other don't uh, treat others well to treat others well. So what would be a good way that these people can get out of that mindset and that shift because maybe the mood in a fancy casino in the middle of the Mediterranean is going to be a little bit nicer than it's going to be when you're grinding out the the monthly tur monthly big tournament series at the Wind Casino or at the Lodge Poker Club. Yeah, I think I, w I will say that Triton did a very good job, and I, I will say that it start it starts with them, right? From the moment you walk in, everything they cater to the players, and everything is just really exceptional and very well thought thought out, and just like the execution is on another level. So I will say they set the tone for how people are going to treat each other. Mm -hmm. But I will say as somebody who has spent the past two World Series being very intentional with my energy and, and controlling, being responsible for how I show up when I play, because for a large part of my career, I was just like, man, everyone's so jaded, everyone's so negative, everyone's so X, Y, Z. And then I just decided that I'm going to be a good person and I'm going to show up at the table with like positive energy. I've had way more positive interactions in the past two World Series the two world series than I have in like probably 15 years of live poker. And that's because of I'm choosing to lead with love and, and I'm showing up in a positive light and not being so cynical and deciding that people are inherently good and they need to be reminded of it. And it it's not exhausting because I'm just choosing to see the light. And whenever I have to deal with shit, I'm quick to put people in their place, right? Like I'm love and light, but I'm also fuck you. So I'm quick to put people in their place but I do it in a more gentle way and like, a, hey, these are my boundary and you're going to respect it. And you don't have to agree with it, but you are going to respect it, right? And you are going to respect this person next to you and you're not going to talk to a dealer this way. You're not going to treat somebody like this, you know? And it's just remembering that we're at the end of the day, we're all human and we need to treat each other as such and stop being like this idea that like, oh, like you are a little bit cynical. You do have a little bit of like half glass empty mentality when it comes to, I think a, a lot of the work that you've done away from poker in the past year has opened your eyes to a lot of things. And I think that makes it harder for you to see things through rose colored lenses. And it's not about like seeing things as bullshit, but just deciding that like, I like for me, I'm just gonna pull, I'm gonna try to pull the good out of people, so. I like it. I like it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Trying to pull the good out of people. So we should try to pull the good out of people. I like that. I like that. Focus. Go into the table. Positive mindset. I mean, I normally, when I go into play poker, I normally have a positive mindset that I'm going to win at poker for that day. In terms of how I feel about the people around me, I can't say I'm thinking about the better of their vibe, right? Their vibration. I'm not saying, how do I raise everybody's vibration at the table here? and come to the table and be this lighthouse of energy for everyone at the table and but if they say something the dealer fuck, you know get on them like you're like you're basically yeah, saying like that i think i think the thing is is like i'm not going into these 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 i'm not going in being like okay how am i gonna light everyone's everyone's day mm -hmm. i'm going in thinking like how am i gonna have a good day and i know in order for me to have a good day i can't relinquish my control to anybody else. so i'm not gonna let anyone like yes people can affect me if I let them and yes people like I am emotional and I get overwhelmed and I cry and I, I'm sensitive and like I can get angry and I can be upset and I can be whatever but I'm not going to let those moments be the barometer of how I react and and interact with people I'm going to respond in the way that I know like I I can respond in love and even if I'm putting people in their place right like I can still be me and be light and have a good time. And if somebody wants to be a dick, that's on them, but I'm not gonna let them affect the type of energy that I bring forth to the table. Got it, got it. Okay, it makes sense too. So you're not letting anyone else, and you're at the table, you're playing, you're upbeat, you're still gonna be high energy, even if somebody else at the table is trying to, trying to bring you down or trying to, trying to let impose their own, their own feelings and beliefs and ideas on you. I mean, that's kind of a thing we talked about where you have the option to take what serves you in some way. So if this person's putting out that energy, you can always find a lot of different kinds of energies around you from other people. So you have the option to choose what you let it impacts you theoretically, right? Now everybody, some people would argue and say, well, maybe I can't, I don't know how to control that. 
But when you are taking care of your mind, when you're meditating, when you're in control of your thoughts, when you have good reframes built, when you've done the work, as you say, to reframe a lot of those situations, then you're able to keep operating in this in this uh, vibration that you're trying to maintain and, and trying to to live out and kind of spread that kind of message and energy to other people at the table when you're, when you're participating. And that's come back to you in terms of opportunity or the way people treat you, I would imagine, or would you say that's not true? Would you say that people still treat you the same way, but you just let it impact you differently than you may, may be used to? I think, be, I think maybe if people are treating me differently, it's because I'm one, treating myself differently and I'm also treating others differently. I think it really starts it really starts with with me and how I'm showing up and I can't expect to I'm not going to walk into a room with my hand out and be like okay, treat me well, you know? Now I'm walking into rooms and I'm thinking what can I give in this situation whereas before I would walk into moments and situations and think what can I get out of this? Right. right. So I think that's what's changed for me personally. So I can't speak on everyone's like growth journey and and how they show up in whatever their effective worlds are. But I know for me, that's been the biggest shift. And I've seen a massive change in the way that I see things, the way that I experience things. And listen, like I have, like a lot of people don't know like my full journey, you know, but like with my, like my son had major health issues five years ago, I had to quit working. Like five years ago, I was on food stamps. Like this is not like, I, I am someone who has, found so much perspective in things because life landed it out of me. And it's, I'm so grateful that, uh, that I didn't have this experience 10 years ago. Like, I don't know that I would appreciate it and like understand the gravity of it as much as I would, as I do now, you know, like 10 years ago, I was this different person. I was still on my journey to being a better person, but there is no way that I would have really fully understood what was happening to me and as grateful as I am now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very, very wise perspective, my young friend, Ebony Kenny. Very wise perspective. The chat's fired up. They're leaving all kinds of comments in there. Shout out to Joe Liberta in the chat. Shout out to David Stewart, Pappy Van Winkle, Ben Allen, Disc Blaster. What's up, guys? What's happening? I know I haven't been doing much YouTube, but uh, but uh, here we are. We're back to you. Yeah, and you, I, Ebony, I, this is, you're my second, you're basically like the third podcast I've done or fourth podcast I've done in like a year and a half. But I felt, I felt, and, the, and, you've, I and felt, you've done two Kennys. I know, Bryn Kenny and then Ebony <laughs> Kenny. I know. I feel like, I feel like a lot of what you say is very inspirational and you're able to give off that impression to a lot of other people because a lot of people don't have that kind of positive energy in their life. So you mentioned that you're able to provide that for others, but you're not able to let others provide that for you or you haven't found those right people in your life. And it sounds like that's what you get out of conversations with people like me and you talk or when you talk with your mental game coach. And and it sounds like those kind of conversations are important for you to use as affirmations to yourself to remind yourself of the kind of person that you want to believe that you are. But for some reason, it seems to be some, some issue where you're have in the past let these other people's opinions impact you and set your beliefs and put you inside of a box in some ways and now you're working really hard and you're saying like fuck that shit i'm not gonna let that happen anymore and i'm gonna break outside that box and you're not gonna tell me what i can do and i can't do and you're not gonna tell me what i can say and can't say or act or believe or dream or whatever and i'm just gonna fucking i'm gonna go after what i really want to be doing and you think you're at that time in your life your kids moved out you're they're getting older so now you can really maybe no, they're, lock they're, in. they're living at home they're not they're not they didn't move out i mean close enough they're old now i mean they're basically you know what's the difference now right come on <laughs> i love it they do not they do not miss you joey it's so hilarious they don't miss me oh i don't miss them at all don't worry i don't miss them yeah i don't miss your your young kid i mean listen oh my god I mean, they were, they were cool, I guess. I don't know. I mean, I don't know, man. You know? <laughs> Big Poppy. Big Poppy wasn't poppying around that time. I don't know, man. That was a weird time. Shout Luke Short. Shout Hashtag King. Uh, ben Allen says, Phil Nagy, Jason Kuhn, Phil Ivy. It sounds like every man she meets is treating her great. You know what? The thing is, is like the entire week, I was in such shock. And I said it any time it came to my mind. Like, I was just like, like we would be sitting there playing or the dealer would like be shuffling cards and I would be like, holy fuck guys, like you guys just play these like 50 kids all the time. Like this is just your life. 
And even on the, the morning of the 200K, I was like, good morning, guys, 200K, just like normal? What would you guys eat for breakfast? Or this is just like, did you have anything special? Because this is, this is a lummy. You know, like I just, I, I think there's like this idea that you have to be so stoic in poker and you can't show any excitement and you can't let people know like how, so, how much something matters to you. And I just hate that. Why, like, why do we have to pretend like it's so like, like I'm aloof or I'm being, dis I'm just like, oh, it's fine. Like I'm going to be, I was detached from all outcomes for this entire trip, but I was living in it. I was taking in every moment and every time I literally surveyed the land, I was like, this is a lot. And I just let people know. And Fedor said, like, he told me, he was just like, it was like, he was just like, yeah, like you can see your excitement and it's like really cool. And it's just like, it gives people perspective. Like this, this isn't my shit. I don't do this. So <laughs> yeah, I'm excited to be here. Mm -hmm. And they felt that. And it was really nice. Like, to be honest, because you, when you, when you watch these players play at home, we think like they're so robotic and they're just, they're not very social at the table. And you have a few players that are, uh, but for the most part, like the table talk is so quiet, you know? And then I just realized that like, when you just interject a little of like the human element, they respond and they, like there was a hand during the, I think it was during the 25K um, where uh, Ivan Liao was playing with a big pair of sunglasses and one of the players sitting next to him was like, oh, let me wear your sunglasses. We are on the feature table. And I was like, oh, can I also wear them during a hand? And me and the, and the, and the other guy, I can't remember his name, we got heads up. And so he put the glass, I even handed him the glasses for the flop. And then on the turn, he handed them to me. And so we played the hand. And then on the river, we're heads up in the pot. I just hand them to Christoph Vogelsang hmm. and he puts them on. And we just have them on. And he's just sitting there like he's in the hand, like making like, and there's just nothing. And it's just like, these are fun moments. It's like, they're not closed off to having these moments. They just need somebody to interject a little fun and personality and vibrancy on the table. And yes, I'm still taking this very seriously, but I'm also going to fucking have fun because when is the next time I'm going to be here? Maybe the next Triton Poker Series. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, I don't know. It sounds like a good marketing opportunity for ACR. I think every poker site should be... That's what That was my big takeaway from this was that every poker site, poker site, shite should be putting <laughs> in their best ambassadors for these events because it's such great marketing for that company theoretically right i mean these guys got to track these things right i don't know if phil Nagy's in the lab tracking the the roi and the return and, and all these different metrics from the ebony kenny experience on Triton poker but i know that the best players are able to do that at that at that level in terms of doing that kind of thing so i wouldn't be surprised mm -hmm. in the future if we see some other site representatives out there playing and bring in a new taste a new flair a new flavor and a, a new kind of vibe that you brought to that table. So I know people out there were real excited, all the comments. I saw a lot of positive comments about you at the final table personally, but it seemed like everybody enjoyed themselves. You got a lot of love on social media. A lot of people submitted questions and ideas, and we'll kind of talk a little bit more about those in a second here. We got some donations, my man, Liang Chang with the 1999 Canadian and the 999 Canadian. Hey. Shout out to Lang, <laughs> shout out to Lang. We throw the Manscaped push up there for you. Shout out to Manscaped. I, 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 thank you very much, guys. I appreciate that. Dean C, everybody, light your Vega. Thank you, Dean C, 420 donation. Mm -hmm. Jean Francois Rod, 999 donation. Is Ebony now the single highest female winner ever? I don't think so. And question Would she have played differently if she bought in with her own money? There is no way of knowing. Yeah, I, I, know. I will say, money, what, no matter the fact that I wasn't playing with my own money, it's just fucking scary. Yeah. It is scary. It's scary. It's intimidating. Every every time I played a hand, when I was done with the hand, I would literally go. Whoosh. It was so intense. It felt like the ultimate pressure cooker. It sounds like it. Yeah, it does sound intense. A little Adderall and some edibles would have been great at that moment in time for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, David Stewart, Queens in the chat. Do style. Gigi knows how to pick an ambassador. Yeah, Gigi's ambassador strategy is just a uh, high find as many people as they can and uh, bring them on board. So I think they're doing a pretty great job. They got a lot of nice, great representation on there. So your experience with ACR, Phil Nagy, people want to know about a little bit about the ACR stuff. So you're still sponsored by ACR. You're working with them. 
Uh, obviously, they're always in the in the media for bots and for all kind of things like that. I basically have been battling, battling my brothers and sisters from Eastern European on ECR lately, and just because I got I got a sick I got a sick sensation for feeling what the bot the real bots are in that game. But maybe talk a little bit about what's going on with ECR, Ebony. How's that going? Well, you're ridiculous with these with these like bot comments, Joey. Um, but also, mean? like I played with a me? lot of Eastern Europeans this week in during the Triton series. Uh -huh. So, <laughs> I mean, maybe ACR is an uh, Eastern European poker poker site at the cash game level then too. I mean, I I can't I can't speak on you know what happened with cash games. I can't speak on what happens behind the scenes. I you know I only have the information that they give us, and and believe me when I say that like. The team pros are working so hard behind the scenes within the within the ACR and like the upper the upper you know staff working really hard to make sure that we bring a product that we are proud of. Because for me personally, like I I am a, I'm someone who I've made a lot of mistakes in my life and I'm looking for progress over perfection. And the fact of the matter is that ACR is constantly trying to progress and they're trying to improve and they're working really hard to to create a site that like I, I'm happy to play on. I'm happy to represent ACR. I love what they stand for within like we look at our team and we have a, a really diverse team and we're working on getting more diversity, more inclusivity, and they're working really hard. And and I think that you know, while Phil Nagy doesn't always make the best decisions, I do think that he takes the biggest and the biggest chances and is willing to, he works really hard for poker players and he really does truly want to make poker better for everyone. And his, 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 for him, it really is about the experience as poker players. And that's why I'm signed with ACR. Like I could, I could be with anyone and I'm choosing ACR. So. Hmm. I like it. Makes sense. I'm not gonna. I, should I go? Should I go in on that comment, or should I? I could go. I could go. Man, oh my god, I'm like thirsty, hungry for the ACR talk. I got the ACR representative on here, but no. Uh, yeah, I mean it makes sense, right? I think ACR does some great things for the community as well. They just have some core issues in the past that have allowed a lot of their customers to be defrauded by people breaking terms of service, and obviously they've acknowledged that by giving out hundreds of thousands of dollars of refunds after the last set of investigation videos that I was a part of and after I got Phil Nagy, the great ACR CEO on my podcast. Listen, and for him to a talk lot about of, that a too. lot of companies, a lot of had made have made mistakes and they've rectified those mistakes. I mean, we have fucking you know, you have poker stars who increase their rake and basically like practically eliminated their supernova elite program and just like totally like told their players like a, a big fuck you. You know, Agreed. so like there are a lot of sites that have been involved in a lot of shit. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people that have been involved in a lot of shit. And there I have done things that I'm not proud of in my past. Does that mean that I don't have a chance to like get better and work towards becoming a better? Agreed. Like yeah. if I had decided that I'm just like, if I had just decided that I was this person 15 years ago and there was no room for growth and people were just like, no, you're a shit human and you're always going to be a shit human. If I had listened to that, I wouldn't be who I am now, which is someone I'm very proud of being. So this is why I work with ACR because they are trying to get better. They are working constantly trying to improve and they're mm -hmm. listening to us and it takes time, but they're doing it. Makes sense. I like that a lot. Okay. Yeah, it's true. People do make mistakes, right? Everybody make mistakes. Everybody got to learn and try to do better in the future and try to keep getting better at it. I would agree. It's a good point. Melissa is in the chat. Shout out to Melissa, Poodog Melissa in the chat. There were some comments about Nagy. Hopefully Nagy's appropriate. I don't even know what that's about. I I I I, I kind of I missed like eight months, ten months. I think something happened with Phil Nagy. I don't I don't really know, so uh, I can't speak on that too much. Uh, some other I got a bunch of other questions as well too. Uh, I think Sean McCormick asked about relationships and how important relationships and connections are in the poker world. And what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I will say that this entire experience was i don't i don't know what it would have been like without having chance corneth from chip leader coaching and jason sue on my team to really lean in and and talk to um and 
I think it really is just like deciding to, to go for it, right? Like I had reached out to Seth months ago and asked for coaching and it's just like, I was so afraid to ask. I was like, oh, this is, this is wild. And this is, this, this, it seemed like a lot, you know, and, and I did. And then, you know, now he was somebody that like, I got to like, kind of like pick his brain on breaks, which was such a nice, nice thing to have. And I think it's just about like going out on a limb to uh, to reach out to people that you admire and trying to offer value to them. And, or, you know, if they have a, a service that you can spend, like the, you, you could buy from them or whatever, instead of, you know, leaning in and being like, hey, can I get a piece of you? Can I, you know, and when I say a piece of you, I mean like the, when you think about these people that you see on TV, like everyone's always to access something from them for free, right? Like whether they want to take a picture, they want to do this, or they want their time, or they want advice on like, hey, I played this hand, like what do you think I should have done here? Like, it's just like everyone everyone approaches these people with trying to get something from them. And I think it's just very important to think about like what you can give in in these scenarios and, and try to build a community of, of givers. Like, you know, like I'm gonna give, like you and I, we've connected on a much deep, deeper level over the past couple of years because we are, I, I think the the simultaneous shift that's happened for both of us is we're both working really hard on trying to be better people and diving deeper, and we give to each other in our in our conversations. You know, like we really give. We're very present, and I think that's the difference. Like you don't just call me and like ask for advice and then hang up the phone. You know, like if I have questions I need to give you like or that I I want to ask you I ask and we talk and like we, I'm like hey let's let's bounce ideas off of each other and it's a two-way street this isn't a one-way thing and I think a lot of poker players are just thinking about like oh how can I get to the top and for me it's not about how can I get to the top it's it's how can I get to where I'm going with as many of my people as possible period mm -hmm. bring your community with you bring your people with yeah. you bring your friends with you bring the people around you with you yeah, I think that makes 100%. a lot of sense. Yeah, I like that a lot too. I like that a lot. I mean, it seems like now you got a whole support system around you with team, with ACR, with the people that are working there. They brought in a lot of different people that weren't there in the past that are more supportive and a lot of the team has more cohesiveness and, and uh, they've got some different names on there. Everyone's sort of been evolving and growing in their own paths and as better content creators, ambassadors, players as well too. So it sounds like you have a... Uh, a good setup over there. Yeah, I'm I'm very happy. I'm I'm really grateful. Obviously, like you're asking me two days after I just like scored for 1.7 million, which in in an opportunity that wouldn't have happened without you know ACR and Phil Nagy, and also like ultimately like I was talking to Jeff Gross today, and I don't think this happened without Bill Perkins, because True. I found. Twitch and you know from Thirst Lounge, and Phil Nagy found me through Twitch. So there's there's a lot of there's a lot of full circle things happening, you know. Um, and yeah, I, I'm really grateful to be where I am right now. And I am. It's not lost on me everything that's happening. Mm -hmm. It's it's yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> I think people people like seeing nice people win in poker. Especially when we've seen a lot of people that aren't necessarily the nicest people or personalities or how they act and they're just not very likable people. So I think anytime somebody like you who's actually likable and you are seem like a very nice person to people, you very treat people well and you try to with respect and try to bring people along with you, I think people really can recognize and feel that by the response that I personally saw from the community. So I think moving forward you know, one big question I had is how does how has your life changed now? Because before maybe you're playing a certain schedule with live tournaments or with your streaming schedule, and now you may have a lot more options and there's more live tournament poker series than ever all around the world. So how do you think your life changes here? To be honest, like I'm, I'm excited to get home. Like I leave tomorrow, I go back home for five days. Um, so I'm gonna play no poker. I'm just gonna decompress and just absolutely try to take it all in because it's still, oh fuck. It still like hits me in waves and oh shit. <laughs> 
yeah, so it's hitting me now. It's like, it's really wild, everything that's happening, and it feels so surreal. God damn it! And, uh, I, think, I think it's okay. I think it's all, doing so good. Oh, uh, it's all good. I know. Um, but I'm just, I'm just allowing myself to like feel all of it. And my biggest goal now is like I looked at the Triton player pool, and I don't want to be the only woman anymore. So I plan on really, really doing work and. I go to Aruba for two weeks to play the WSOP circuit event. And before the ladies event, I'm going to be hosting a luncheon um, and just talking to other women and just showing them that, that, you know, I'm here and I support you and please, please use me. Like ask me anything that you want to know. And like, I will give whatever I can to show support and to make it easier for the women that come after me because if there's anything that I can do, like that, if, if there's any one job I have, that's it in poker, is to make it better and safer and more loving and more inclusive for women to play play this game that I love so fucking much. So that's all, is I want to host more of these and have like massive fucking, like I want every woman in poker in one room to, to, to talk and get together and exchange information and, and just really support and love each other and stop with this mindset mm-hmm. that there can only be one at the top or stop with the slut shaming, you know, and, and stop with this like negative attitude of like, well, I would support her if X, Y, Z, like stop, just stop. Yeah. I love that. It's awesome. Ebony. Yeah. Yeah. Chad, obviously very supportive of you. I mean, it's great to see emotion in poker. You know, a lot of people are robots at the highest stakes and to get to that point, to be able to sustain those swings, some people really turn off their emotions and suppress it. So I think it's great. People love to see, see somebody happy and have a great feeling and really achieve the poker dream that so many people out there dream of having this big score and, and, uh, being able to play at that stage and at that level and to, to know that they can do it. So I think that's awesome, man. That's really cool. It sounds like for you moving forward, it just you gotta take take it in and see what comes to you. You got the documentary you were shooting up there. You had a camera crew following you along. Following you along. That's gonna that documentary is gonna come out. I think next year at some point in time, hopefully. And people are gonna get to see that. And then you get to go back home and you get to decide what events am I gonna play. So do you have some plans yeah. coming up for the events that you're gonna play, or what's what are you thinking about on that end? I mean, I'm for sure. So Aruba's for two weeks, which is such a long time. So like I've been here for two and a half weeks. Um, I've been traveling so, so much. I think since, oh my God, I want to say since May and maybe even before then, because I know I went to Uruguay in April. It's like, I've been traveling so, so much. So since the beginning of the World Series, I think I've been home for a total of about three and a half weeks since June 1st. Um, so I really just want to be home for a little bit. Um, I'm going to really work hard, uh, get these podcast episodes out that I vowed to get out. I got 20 episodes to get out by the end of the year, uh, that I get to get out by the end of the year. And I'm really excited, um, and to really provide like uh, a safe space for women to, to share and be vulnerable. Um, so that is a big priority of mine as is, um, creating a free coaching space for women in poker, um, not poker strategy as much as like a community of support and love and how to have confidence at the table, just being, you know, being themselves. So I think those two things are my biggest priority. I'm still going to stream on Twitch. I'm still going to go back to grinding my, (laughs) What did you say on the trial? Like from thirty-three dollars to two hundred k buy-in. <laughs> it was so funny. Oh, Someone said, "How'd you go from thirty-three to two hundred k?" I was like, "Oh yeah, I mean, that's pretty, pretty, pretty normal of a thing, you know. That's all. That always happens to everybody." Yeah, no big deal. <laughs> so um, your podcast yeah. is coming. So you got a podcast. It's gonna. You did some episodes before, right? But your issue has always been being consistent, of course, with the show. So. Now you're going to be more consistent with your podcast where you talk with other women and uh, what's it called? Magic, sex and coffee. 
Yes, okay, Magic okay. Sex and Coffee. Magic Sex yeah. and Coffee, so had, beautiful. There's some old episodes up, and uh, those were basically like me just like laying in my room, just talking, and they were just like me monologuing to myself, which I'm very good at. Fine. Uh, and then I had a couple of episodes for another podcast that I started called Uncaged Collective. So I'm very good at starting things. True, true. Uh, you, you know this about me. You know true. me very well. And uh, this is why, like, I enrolled, uh, you know, my community via social media to hold me obligate, like, hold me accountable. And a lot of people have been messaging me, and it's been great because they're like, where the fuck are these podcast episodes, bitch? And I'm like, yes, okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so 20 by the, 20 by the end of the year, 20 by the, what if not, if not, you go out with a viewer from the chat, listen, smash the like button. If you want Ebony to go out with a viewer from the chat, if, if, uh, she doesn't achieve these things, listen, WSOP next year, you take, if you don't get 20, then you owe one of my viewers a a, a date. Deal. Booked. Booked. Perfect. Listen, <laughs> you want a chance to win the date, you guys comment below. <laughs> if you're in the live chat, it ain't going to work out, but you got to comment below and say, I'm registering for the Ebony Kenny date. And people are going to be hoping that you don't do that 20 because they're going to want to win that date with you. I mean, listen, you just got this score walking around that great orange dress, those great accessories. I think people are, Ooh, dude. I know, I think they're going <laughs> to listen. And if you, and if you do do the 20, I think I might, I'm, I would say you win a date with me, but you can't win a date with me. I don't think uh, Alice GTO is going to be liking that too much. So I'll go on a date. I'll go on a d- date with Alice. You'll go on a date with my my girl. She would love it. She would love to go on a date with you, hundred percent. I know. I know. She I'm like it. one of her favorite people. The fuck? I will take Alice out. Okay, I think she does love you. And- and I'll buy you. I'll buy you some more popcorn and wine. It'll be good. Thank you. That'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> where where do they where do they find your pot? Yeah, that's I forgot about that. Yeah, we had the we had the yeah those, those are. We should have made those the podcast. Because really, know. we don't really talk much poker, right? Like I had you on here as basically an excuse to talk to you on my podcast because one, I need to wash the taste of bring Kenny out of my mouth, and two, shall I bring Kenny? And I'm not listening. I mean, it is what it is, right? You know, I know this guy. It is what it is. What it is. Shall I bring Kenny? Right? He's doing his own thing. You doing? You bring Kenny Land is what it is, right? So, but I needed to wash the taste out of my mouth, and who better than the great Ebony Kenny, fresh off her offer new experience playing with these 200k the the high rollers so what was the did anything stand out about the players was it a big uh, you know the biggest differences in player strategies they used against you or did any of the players stand out as someone that was like oh my god this person feels like they're playing on a different level or what are your thoughts on that i mean so thank God I didn't get uh, I didn't play with the Damo all week until yesterday during the 50k turbo, and he's he's someone that he is just he's gonna he's gonna put you in spots he's gonna like the thing about this field is you gotta have a plan you have to have a plan in every step I and if you don't they are gonna destroy you that's it. Like they're just gonna pick you off, and I I, I learned that, and uh, it definitely has made me aware of the areas that I want to improve and the areas I can see like that I'm I'm pretty strong in and that I want to get very strong in, you know. So mm-hmm. it's kind of revealed my very weak spots, and I'm like, all right, damn, I don't want to stand for this, and I'm actually so excited to just now I'm like pumped and excited to play the world like I was already ready to play the world series next year and excited about it because for the past two uh series I've had um like you know break summers which is like for when you play a full schedule when you play like 50k in tournaments when your average buy-in is like 3k it's like hey it's like maybe even like 2k it's like it's like decent you know you feel like something is on its way and so that's how i was feeling after this year's world series and so i'm i'm just very excited to play because playing with with these guys just showed me what is possible within the game of poker like watching it live and being able to experience it in game is much different than watching it on tv and seeing um you know seeing the commentators and you know just being able to experience it Mm-hmm. being at the table it's so intense mm-hmm. uh but Ad- adamo is someone that definitely i i'm just like please uh, please 
I was so happy when he got moved from my table. I was like, yes, okay. So ba basically you're saying that they are, I mean, this is com this is the common differences. I wrote a book about the difference between the the greatest poker, the high stakes poker players and the not the high stakes poker players, but still people that are good at poker, chasing the poker dream, the qualities of a successful high stakes poker player. And uh, the best poker players are locked in constantly and they're trying to fight after every single pot. Uh, they don't really take much time off. They don't take a decision off. Yeah. They try to find every single spot. They're thinking through every single thing and you think that's obvious, but that's not what happens. Like most people, they autopilot, they're playing a lot of games or they're just not thinking or they don't even know what to think about necessarily in some ways. So you're not necessarily gonna find that same kind of approach at the high stakes level where in general, in the competitive environment, this is again in competitive games, you're gonna see in general, people are gonna be playing and acting differently. So for you, you're saying that when you go back and uh, you're playing your own sessions, just taking your time through each thought, realizing how important each bet could be and trying to yeah. stay locked in and in present for as long as you can. And that's where having the great mental game preparation, having good diet, having good meditation habits, drinking water, staying locked in. This is why all of this is even more important now than ever, debatably, because people are able to think at an extremely high level and they're able to have a lot of tools that give them a lot of really specific answers so for yourself, do you plan to do you plan to up the technical study habits that you've been doing compared to in the past, or what's your plan for how you plan to technically prepare for the games in the future that you're gonna play? Yeah, so one of my my two only like big purchases, um, I'm buying my infrared sauna and a cold plunge uh, tub that also converts to a hot tub. So these are like two things that I'm like fucking pumped as fuck about, like creating like a little biohacking for my home. And uh, so having access to that and being able to like start my day with the cold plunge, going to the infrared sauna after a workout, you know, like is something that paired with, uh, you know, meditating and hydrating is some like I know is such a valuable tool. It's something I respond very well to as I've been, you know, for the past year, I've been paying for a membership at an infrared sauna place in Austin, uh, where I live. Um, so I, I know the value, like for me, that's very valuable. And on top of that, um, starting in October, I'm doing a sober October. So for the World Series, I did no drinking. Uh, for the first time, I had a no drinking bet with Abe Styles, a fellow ACR team pro. And it was a it was a free roll drinking bet, and I was like, oh, what do I have to lose? And I loved it, and I just took edibles, and and I ate really clean. I ate carnivore ish for about thirty five days, right? And I, like a fucking goddamn superhero. Like I was just like, holy shit, I'm thinking so clearly. And uh, so after I celebrate for the next week or two, I am I'm in Aruba until October fourth. But starting October 1st, I'm not drinking, and I will probably carry that on into November. Uh, and because I did two and a half months of no drinking during the World Series. So I think or, or about a month and a half, mm -hmm. eight weeks, eight weeks of no drinking. So I'd like to just do that again and really focus on taking care of my body. And now that I'm working with Chance and Jason, really just create a system that feels sustainable because obviously the past six weeks that from the time that I've known that I was playing Triton to coming out here was like a crash course and how to, how to do the best I can. Um, that's not what we're going to be doing moving forward. Uh, but I do, I am going to continue with chip leader coaching and with chance and, and really um, create a system that, is best for me and will allow me to hopefully achieve more and get more million dollar scores. Cool. <laughs> yeah. That, belt. That's wild. That's awesome. Yeah. That's, that's really great to hear. Uh, so yeah, so it's not like you got your plan, you got your poker lined up, you have your plan for how you're going to study and keep working at your game and keep improving. And I guess you just got to figure out, you know, what events you're going to play, what kind of deals those might look like. Uh, we did get another, another donation from Leon Chang. Fifty nine ninety nine. I, 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 Ebony is a legend. Listen, Bill Perkins, die with zero jet flying on by. Thank you very much. <laughs> Doug Polk will dance. Doug Polk will dance in, in, in his seat right now in, in celebration of that of that donation. Thank you. What is that dance? That's Doug Polk. Hold on. 
Is is that a Doug Polk dance? Supreme, I need to a, see is, this. Mr. Senor, Senor Supreme. Yes, sir. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The Supreme Leader, sir. Yes, sir. Supreme Leader, sir. He running, he running the barracks of Austin, Texas at Lodge right now. He's setting up the barracks down there for his new military offense, which will be the online poker, live poker. I don't know what the hell he's going to do, right? Maybe he's going to do online poker. I would imagine, like, that's he's competing in the operator space now, so... He seemed like he got a good operation down there. I don't know, man. He did. Uh, he's doing all these stream games. He's crushing all these, all the, all the fun player. I don't know what's going on down there, but he seemed like he got a good setup. So big shout out to Doug. We'll have to catch up with him soon. Uh, Natutska Habarushi says, "Please cue Will Jaffe, three purple eggplants and a folded hands. Holy moly!" <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the hell it means, buddy. Uh, Ebony, why don't you give some shout outs? I got to refill this water. My mouth's getting a little dry. The edible kicking in. And uh, then right, we'll, then we'll, go we'll... through and, and read some of the chat. And yeah. I know Keish is in here and Cosmo and Jess. Let's see who else. Oh, thank you, the Queen's Janet. Who cares about the sponsorships and everything? You did that. Thank you. Thank you. There was another woman in the 200K, I think, or no. Yeah, there were two other women. Uh, they both played on the business side. So I was the solo. Uh, female pro poker player. Adam, thank you. Good to see a little emotion poker these days. <laughs> thank you. I am a crybaby, y'all. I I just let my emotions all hang out like I'm just, I'm an open book. It is, it is what it is. I cry watching random YouTube vid, vid so who knows what I'd be doing if I banged a milli ball at poker. <laughs> uh, yes, Matthew, you can play on ACR. Uh, let's see. Dun, dun, dun. I really enjoy seeing someone such a personality when at poker. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, honestly, I'm like so overwhelmed by the love. It's so exciting. The thing that's like really wild to me is, uh, is like how many I don't want to. I, I don't want to shout out to the haters, but I just want to encourage the people who like see someone having a good time or experiencing something good in their life. I just encourage them to like think about why my joy triggers you so much, you know, and just think that like it's not about me. It's about you, and it's okay. You you could heal, you know. My other people's joy used to trigger me too. The and hater, the hater they're triggered. Were they triggered? Love myself. Where were they triggered at? They were upset? The haters were upset? What were they saying? Yeah, I mean, I don't, saying? I don't care what oh. they were saying. The I'm only just, thing I really saw gonna... them say was discussing about the deal, right? They, were, they seem like, so this is normal, right? When you're a poker player and you see somebody else with a sponsorship or get the big deal, you're always saying, you well... know, why can't... <laughs> What? Sorry, one of my old, he Who? was part of my crew. Who? Will Rodriguez. He goes, Ebony's favorite hand still three and Jack Nine suited. It sure fucking is. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen All right, to sorry. That. Go ahead. Yeah. No, no, you're fired up. You're fired up. Shout out to Will. Shout out to Big J in the chat. Big Jamin out there. What's up, Big J? What's happening, brother? Hey. But yeah, I, I didn't see too many people really upset at you that you won, but they were just curious about the deal. And a lot of people get, you know, all weird about that whole thing as well with the deal. They feel like they're private information. We already kind of discussed this earlier. So I didn't yeah. see too many haters, but you're basically just saying, I mean, they, I, I mean, listen, I've been dealing with this, these comments a long time. The comments to me, yeah. they don't, you know, they're not really, they don't, they don't bother me anymore. It's so funny. Cause like Camille and I could, Camille was like, I was showing her like this wild thread of someone who is not it living in reality. And I was just like, ha ha, like this is so funny to me. And Camille's like, oh my God, like this actually just like infuriates me. And I'm, and I was like, oh no, you gotta detach. Like I've learned to detach completely because I know that truly, truly it's not about me. It's about them and whatever they're going through. And I just like, I just, whenever I see things like that now, like I just like, oh, I wish you healing. Like, to be honest, like I, I, I want you to have peace because I don't ever want anyone to feel as much turmoil as this person's feeling to where they have to be so bitter and angry on social media with someone else just having like pure joy. Also, there's someone on social media, I think it's fucking hilarious. I think they think I'm Bryn Kenny. Like, because they just see the last name Kenny and they keep calling me like a cheater and like that I've been cheating forever on GG and like all this stuff. And I'm just like, bro. Like, and they, they keep saying, like, I'm not going to watch this asshole cheater 
uh, play the final table and like they were like commenting on everything and I'm just like laughing so loud or so hard because I'm just like oh they, I think they actually think I'm Bryn Kenny so you're not Bryn Kenny I mean I could be okay you're not Bryn Kenny okay so there's <laughs> so you're dealing with all the attention that comes from the big score now and I guess now you got to figure out you know what to where that goes and I think a lot of people out there as content creators they always try to Right. Once you get some attention, that's the time that theoretically you want to pounce on it. I like to do the opposite where when I get a lot of attention, I like to just disappear because I like to let the attention calm down a little bit, you know, cool down. Like when you get a lot of a lot, a lot, a lot of attention, it's so overwhelming and so energetically draining that it's good to recharge, take a step back from that. A lot of people can try to chase that. And it's really hard to chase the hype. It's really hard to chase all these people commenting on you on a daily basis, caring about what you're doing, yeah. giving you all these things. Like a very few poker players, very few content creators are able to do that at a continuous basis. But a lot of people feel like, okay, I got this taste of it. Now I got to go out there and get more of it. I got to get more of it. I got to get more of it. Got to make more content, do this, do that. Get out there in some kind of way and kind of chase that spotlight, that, that drug of of the, the, the attention in some ways. So... With you, do you feel like you're going to succumb to something like that? Or do you feel like, because also it's a good opportunity when you do have that extra eyeballs on you to set up your next deals, set up your next, any sort of promotion that you do. Not a lot of people are going to want you to come to your event. It's more competitive than ever for getting people to events because there's so many events now. Why wouldn't they want to yeah. have the queen, Ebony Kenny, at their event? A lot of people <laughs> are going to want that event. So figuring out how to navigate that. Kevin Martin has talked about this last night on his, on his, on his Twitch stream. When you try to play poker well, you try to navigate the business side of poker well, you try to do your sponsorships, you try to make content, you try to be a family woman, you try to be a podcaster, being able to manage all that together and do that in a healthy way. Do you feel like yeah. you're prepared to do that right now and to be able to handle that influx of opportunity that comes along with the attention that is headed to you? Uh, I certainly think that uh, if I compare myself to old versions of me, I am the most prepared. This version of me is the most prepared for whatever comes my way from this. Um, to say that, yes, I'm prepared and I can like do whatever like is so presumptuous because I don't know. This is a new situation for me. This is a new um, experience. So I'm not sure how I'm going to handle it. I do know that I've already uh, like my uh, team manager has like asked to ask me to do a couple of interviews uh, before I leave uh, tomorrow. And I've, already, I've just said like, I'm doing this podcast tonight with Joey and I'm not doing anything else uh, until I get back home and I wanna really decompress. And it's, it's very important to me to honor, to like create boundaries for myself and to honor them. Right. Knowing that like the thing that is the most important to me whenever I play or whenever I do something, whenever I show up somewhere where people know who I am and they're expecting something out of me is that I'm authentic. And the best way for me to be authentic is to be rested and to protect myself and to take care of myself in a way that whenever I do decide to go out and show up, I'm like, I get to be my full, full self, you know? And so I know that no matter what I do and where I go, on this journey, it's going to involve a lot of self-care, a lot of boundaries, um, saying more, saying no more than I say yes. Um, knowing that, listen, I spent a long time of my adult life pouring myself out already and like being a total slut. Like I, I, I'm done doing that. <laughs> I don't need to, we're not doing that anymore. You know, I, I'm in a position now where I get to be a lot, uh, have a lot more uh, discretion and be a lot more selective. And so for me, if it's not a fuck yes, it's a no. And that's where I'm going to be spending a lot of my time and how I'm going to use that to make my decision. I love it, that's awesome. So you're gonna choose the best opportunities, the ones that excite you the most, the ones that are calling your name the most, the ones that you feel the strongly most strongly about attending, whether that's an event, whether that's a collaboration, whether that's a piece of content or a direction you do, because you don't need to worry about the the things a lot of people experience at their jobs or with their business is that they feel like they got to keep working if they want to sustain their livelihood. And most people, if they live paycheck to paycheck, then they do have to keep working to sustain yeah. their livelihood because they got to keep paying their rent, pay their mortgage, got to pay for their family, they got to pay for their bills. 
So now you're basically saying after this great series that you had, and now with the opportunities that are coming in, then this is going to give you just way more opportunity and options. So now in the past, you may have had to choose some collaborations or choose some directions in life that maybe you wouldn't have chosen or chosen some deals because you don't have enough leverage. But now that you've got more leverage due to the, the, the social capital and also the financial capital from the actual score, then that's going to put you, I mean, it's crazy, right? How one week can fucking catapult that from really be a life-changing thing. I mean, this is the definition of like a life-changing experience then. I mean, this entire experience has been, you know, truly exceptional and very life-changing. I will say though, that in the past like five years, I've really worked on detaching myself from doing things out of like need or desperation and really choosing things out of desire. So I don't work or partner with anyone that I am not happy to partner with. Um, I, I, for a long time, I did, I, I like to compare like a lot of the decisions I've made in life to my dating life. Cause it's like you put the people that I've dated in a room, they all look so different and they all come from like so many different walks of life. And you know, it, it's like a wild, wild assembly of humans, right? Um, but for a long time, there was a lot of like desperation in the decisions that I was making. Mm -hmm. And in the past five years, I've kind of put that desperation to bed, right? Like I'm, I'm done with that, like in my personal life and my professional life. And I'm just really making decisions from a very intentional standpoint. So before I came out here, like this, one of the, one of the reasons I love ACR so much is I was for two years um, a year, really a year and a half, literally the week that I signed with ACR that they announced that I was a team pro, I was going through some unbelievably difficult stuff behind the scenes with my personal life to where as soon as they announced me, I really wasn't available to stream and do everything that I signed in my contract. And they really just gave me the space and they were like, take your time don't feel obligated to, you know, there wasn't a set amount of hours I had to, to do to show up. And they really just gave me the space to, to breathe and process everything that was happening. And it was very intense. And I was really worried, like for a long time, I was like, oh my God, they're going to just fire me. And this was in the middle of a pandemic where this income really mattered to me. And they just gave me the space to be human and like deal with these situations. So I'm, I'm grateful to them. And they set the tone for me being able to say no to things that don't feel right for me. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's weird that like, if anything, what this trip did was just sealed the deal in me already having that belief and kind of act, not kind of, but in acting that way and choosing that for myself. But now it's just cemented it like, yeah, this is this is how I'm going to live the rest of my life. And I'm going to make decisions that honor who I am and who I want to be in the future. Interesting. OK, makes sense. Makes sense. OK, so fuck yes or fuck no. That's what it sounds like. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, people in the chat, they, they don't they don't like ACR. I mean, it sounds like one one person here is getting a great benefit from ACR and that's you. So. You know, I think a lot of people out there, I mean, I don't know, but people, are, the women opportunity thing, I've heard some people say about that, you know, how important was like being a woman to getting the opportunity. As you said, five people got offered. They didn't go to the event. They didn't, they turned it down. It sounded like the guy, the coach is a guy. So it's not necessarily like you were chosen just for that reason, but you no, know. No, I was, I literally like, there were so many no's and Phil, the way he tells the story is like, he was just like, okay, let me, let me stop thinking about this from like a what's the GTO move for, for poker, right? Like what's the GTO move just from a poker perspective for my $200? Like he just looked at it from like, a, all right, this is forcing me to think outside the box and maybe I give this opportunity to someone who otherwise wouldn't have it. And he's in an interracial marriage and he says himself that he, you know, he has a daughter and he wants, he wants his daughter, you know, in 10, 15 years to look back at him and like be like, hey, my dad helped you know, helped a black woman fulfill this dream. And like, that's a big deal for me that somebody would want, 
you know, that, the, that's a standard. This is standard the stuff feedback. in most businesses, Ebony, right? Like most, there's most communities, there's like funds, there's foundations, there's people that fund startups, there's people it's, that fund lives. It's not standard though. It's in, it, it not in may, poker. Uh, I'm sorry? Not in poker, right? But in other, in other areas, there are yeah, not, in, not in every in neighborhood, industry. but there's a lot of people who do, who do try to do that. Yeah, they try. But the fact of the matter is that like, it's different when like someone wants to hire someone as like a talking head and be like, look, we're doing inclusivity and we're whatever. And it's it's very different when you hire minorities, you work with minorities, you work with women, you work with marginalized communities, and you really work to, you put your money where your mouth is. And like, not only do you hire them, but you listen to them, you take feedback and, you're, and you ask, how can we improve? And I think that's the thing that like, there has been a lot of controversy about Phil and his behavior and, and ACR and whatever, you know, but the, the fact of the matter is that he is taking feedback. He is open to criticism and I put him in his place. I have full autonomy to put him in his place whenever I see, like I am, he doesn't ever make me feel like I, if I see something that he does wrong, I'm like, what the fuck? Stop. And he, and I explained to him how he can do better. And I, because I want the same from the people in my life. Whenever I fuck up, I want people to call me out and I want to be awake enough to see it and to take the feedback so I can grow and improve. And to be honest, like there are, there's, yeah, in theory, there are a lot of companies, like everyone jumps on the bandwagon for Pride Month, you know, everyone jumps on the bandwagon for Black History Month. And then after that, they just forget about it and they stop doing the work. And are you doing the work year round? You know, are you putting your money where your mouth is year round? And this is, this was a statement and he didn't choose me because I'm a black woman. He chose me because he's like, oh, fuck it. Like you're super cool. And Phil and I had never met until this try in. We literally never met. Mm. So. I think I've exhausted my Phil Nagy ACR uh, allotment <laughs> for the year talking about this. I, listen, my number one Good, topic, I, I never, I never want to talk about again, but I got, they, 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 they want the questions. I just asked them the questions, right? Uh, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, listen, I could go in so fucking hard on what you just said, but I'm, I'm gonna choose not to because I am very passionate about ACR. And as they choose to service our great American poker players, they're one of the only service provided to American poker players. You gotta hold these guys to the fucking standard. And that includes the ambassadors too. I feel like these ambassadors just get a free pass, man. You know, people come out, they shill, the, they shill all these products and they have no accountability or responsibility for whatever happens. And uh, that's are we, why are I we talking about are we talking about your 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 great god uh, Doug Polk and I'm talking about I'm talking about like? every everybody in general I'm talking about influencers response content creators media creators it feels like a lot of these people are they take these risky deals and they take deals to promote products and services and then you know it's like oh whatever like I don't I, nothing like if something comes from it they're like ah oh, it wasn't my fucking fault right. And whether that's a, a, a piece of food, whether that's an NFT, whether that's investing, whether that's financial advice, I mean, it's way crazier in other worlds, right? Poker world, you know, it, it, it poker world, right? We don't really have many products and services outside of a poker site. And for the most part, right? Like you sort of know what you're gonna get in a lot of these poker sites, but it's crazy that you have, so, there's no like common set of guidelines or things to follow for a lot of content creators. So they don't really know mm -hmm how or what or, or where they should promote or why it's dangerous to promote it. And in the poker world, especially, you know, you yeah. can lose a lot of money. You, it's really, I think it's really important. I mean, people like they, they make a big deal because no one has incentive to talk about it, but you know, it is what it no, is. No, I mean, I, I, I do agree with you that I do feel like there is a sense of responsibility. I felt this way outside of poker for a long time with content creators and like their, their skinny tees and like the shit they like promote that's like dangerously unhealthy. And like body image stuff, um, I, I am. I do think that you know, with power comes great responsibility. And if you have an audience, you do have a responsibility to them. And for me, as uh, an ambassador and as a content creator, I am always as transparent as possible. And I, I say like, okay, look, for me, this is what I'm comfortable playing. Like, I don't play X, Y, Z. I only play this. I only keep what I'm comfortable with. And this this isn't about ACR. This is like, hello, Black Friday. Like these are reputable sites and then your money was just gone, right? So like anything could happen. Right. And so that's where that's where I stand, you know, whenever I tell people, I'm like, don't keep anything on there. You're not comfortable losing because you don't know what can happen on any of the sites, point blank period. Yeah. And I think that's, 
that's an important thing to remember. And this idea that like, people are like, oh, I had my whole net worth on there. Well, I mean, whose fault was that? You know, this is this is a very different, these are two Maybe different things. Maybe one way to look at it, yeah, I guess so, yeah. You know. I mean, if I, if so, I tell yeah, you- You, you I do have to take repeat. personal responsibility, so I agree. Yeah, it's like, it's your, you, as a, as a person who has, we have, it's never been easier to get information now. You have everyone, majority of people have smart computers at their fingertips. That our phones are better than the first supercomputer, right? Mm -hmm. Are faster and can, and more powerful than the first supercomputer that was created. So it has never been easier to have access to information and to do your due diligence. And I think that that is it's your responsibility as a content creator and it's your responsibility as a consumer so it, it it goes both ways and i am someone who is both a content creator and a consumer and i know that like i have a little bit of uh skepticism in me like i'm very half class full but i do do my reach before i decide to just blindly you know do something because someone i love via social media says that i should do this thing mm -hmm. so yeah, makes sense. I mean, I think, uh, yeah, obviously it's risky out there in NFT and crypto world. So a lot of people out there, I mean, a lot of people I saw, basically they don't think about it like this. They are using their audience to make money off of through shilling them these products and and uh, they get paid why, a lot why of money. Do we use, why do we use the word shilling? I hate this word. What do you want to call it? Promoting? Yeah, like... I mean, if you, like, if you, okay. if you, if you pay me, like I, uh, I got a lot of uh, offers from companies. I get a lot of offers from companies to pay me to literally say whatever the fuck that they want to write to send me. Right. I am yeah, shilling like that you, product. If, if I did that, if, if you don't have any, like, if it's not a product that you use, it's not a product that you care about. If not, whatever that's shilling. Right. But if it's something that you use and you believe in and whatever, then I don't, I don't think it's the same and shilling just, there's so much negative connotation attached to it. And it sounds like it's just like, Dude, ha like the amount of people, every, all these businesses and every dream that's turned into like multi-million dollar businesses started because somebody was passionate about it and they shared with somebody next to them. Mm -hmm. So like for me, like I wear this vibrator around my neck every single day and I talk about it and I'm just like, bro, like I talk about the things that I'm passionate about. I'm not shilling it. I'm like, bitch, this is important to me. It matters to me, period. I mean, both sound like pretty good PR arguments, right? I mean, all this stuff's a fucking straight Fugazi anyway with all this marketing stuff. So, you know, however somebody wants to represent their story or represent their case, I mean, that sounds like a great story to take, right? You know, so I would agree that on one hand, it could be considered chilling. On the other hand, it could be not considered chilling too. So I think a lot of people out there do consider it chilling. And uh, a lot of people that I see are, you know, not in poker, I guess poker, the things that you promote are the online operator, the on, the actual event itself, the training site or the training program, the coaches, the content creators, the podcast. In general, you know, you're probably gonna have a pretty similar experience in terms of, I mean, maybe not actually, right? There's probably a lot of poker sites and a lot of games that you can play that I don't know much about that aren't necessarily quality, so. But I feel like for the most part, most of the content creators I see are promoting Poker Bros, ACR, GG Poker, Party Poker, uh, the regular poker sites and then the event series themselves. So I don't think it's too big of a problem in poker. I've, I, haven't, I haven't seen it like that quite yet. So I don't know. Give me some questions yeah. in the chat, guys. We, we got to try and keep this under two hours, but I know me and you talk for a long time. So uh, I don't want to spend too much time on, on, a, on a little <laughs> few of these topics here. But yeah, I feel like I covered a lot of questions answered in, in all in one year. It's a lot of questions about preparation, which we talked some about as well, too. Uh, general mindset, which I feel like people got to learn a lot about how your mindset thinks and how you like to reframe things and how you have a general po positive, optimistic attitude about things. And you try to look for the best in mm -hmm. things and try to look for the good in things. Whereas some of us are looking for all different angles of things, not always good, but bad too. But I think that's my own challenge for when I think about what I'm going to focus on in the future is to there's a lot of great and there's a lot of not great. So however you spin it is up to you. You can, I can make anyone or anything look bad. If you really wanted to make it look bad, you can focus on the negative repeatedly over and over again. And mm -hmm. po poli mm -hmm. political marketing strategy taught me this, that you can basically just say anything about anybody and it doesn't fucking matter if any of it's true. So you can just say it all, you're a complete sellout shill, piece of shit. I could say that every day for three years straight and it doesn't matter what you say. I can just keep saying that a hundred different ways about anybody. And uh, yeah. 
This my, is my thing is, is like whenever people say something that I know, like say something to me, like I'm not going to defend myself to some somebody that's not, it's not reality for me. Right. And so I don't care. I'm not going to, to defend something that is, is not, I'm just like, okay, cool. That's what you think of me. Yeah. That's on you. That's on you. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Keisha, shout out to Keisha in the chat. The streamers try to sell straining every five minutes is shilling. Uh, yeah, I think that's kind of how they go. Uh, yeah, I feel like we covered a lot of stuff. Do you want to talk about this Daniel Negreanu th tweets? You make you made tweets about Negreanu or something like that. What's sure. what's the deal with what's the deal with you and this guy Daniel Negreanu? What's what's happening with you and him? Sure. Uh, so he, I made a thread, and uh, we saw the thread, and I, I talked about because Daniel Negreanu. My thread was inspired by him asking why more don't more women don't play poker. And I've had some phenomenal experiences in poker. And I made the thread, not discounting the really good experiences I've had in poker, but more to show, right? Like, cause I think a lot of people see me as someone who's like pretty confident, I don't take any shit and those are true. And I've also been greatly affected by some experiences I have had at the poker table in a poker room, not even sit, sit, sitting at the table, maybe just standing in the poker room. You know, I have had a lot of uncomfortable experiences and i think people will look at someone like daniel granu the old version of him not this new i don't know whatever the fuck this is um the old version of him as somebody who is untouchable and that he's not he's incapable of bad behavior and the fact of the matter is that we've all made mistakes we've all done things that we're not proud of right i used to and i i've talked about this so many times I've been very, very honest about this on social media, on Twitter, on Instagram, in my podcast, on stream, in my newsletters, talked about how I used to treat women very badly and how I used to be a pick me, right? So, and I've like, I have rectified the mistakes that I've made in my past. The fact of the matter is that when I tweeted that 100% that happened, and in fact, with him saying like, oh, that didn't happen. And he made this absurd video of like, see what happens when, and he compared me to the woman who said that, whatever her name was, the woman who's like, said that she, he approached her while she was recording or whatever. And he did this like very like obtuse, reactive, where he makes fun of people. Like, I don't know what's happening where he thinks it's cool to like bully people and have this like mocking, mentality as if he is like somebody who remembers every interaction he's ever had. But if you look on two plus two, there is a forum where I was a much worse version of the person that I am now, where I started a thread on, it was uh, introducing a girl who plays 1025 no limit. And there was a thread and someone asked me about my experiences in poker. And in that thread, it was in 2008, or 2009, I talk about this exact story about Daniel Agranio. And unless I planned on still being in poker in 2022 and deciding that I was going to throw Daniel Agranio under the bus and make up this crazy story, this fucking happened. And in the story, there's also a couple of things. You can see how outrageous and how delusional my mind was then because I'm saying that these stories are funny. And it's also the second story that I thought was funny was when Double Fish was saying that he doesn't do fat girls, black girls, or ugly girls. And he laughed and said, oh, you're all in the clear. And like, I thought that was funny. Not like, I'm just like, oh my God, the, the pick me inside that just was accepting bad behavior in order to just be accepted is outrageous. And there's a lot of shit in that thread that I am not proud of. I said some, I said some shit to men in that thread. I own every part of it. That's who I was back then. I made mistakes and I think people can make mistakes. So yes, when I said that Daniel Grani was my poker hero in 2014, it was because I had had interactions with him after the interaction I had with him at Foxwoods. So people can grow and change. I have been so adamant about that, but he has turned into this different version of himself that is so negative he shits on women now and he's his behavior is absolutely disgusting and it's not inclusive and he he avoids confrontation and the way that he deals with it is by like bullying people and not engaging and not having interesting intellectual conversation so in in my opinion he needs to grow the fuck up and be willing to have tough conversations and don't ask questions you don't want the answer to
Hmm. So you're saying that he should be having these conversations with on his podcast or in public or no, not on privately his or not what, for what, his, what, if, well, when he asks questions like why don't women play more poker on Twitter and right. then people give the answer and he doesn't like the answer. He's allowed to not like answer. I mean, it? listen, I don't. That's I, fine. That's you fine. Can, I get a lot of answers. I don't have to like every answer. You have to like the answer. But if you if if the truth involves your some of the way that you treated people like, right, I'm responsible also for maybe there's not more women in poker because of the way that I treated women in the past. Mm -hmm. I haven't always been the person I am now, which is why I work so hard to uplift women because I know the damage I cause mm -hmm. in this in this industry for the people I love the most. Women are my favorite fucking creatures on the planet. And I want to uplift them and love them and make them feel nothing but good things for me forever. And I didn't always do that. I fucked up a lot. I hurt a lot of people and I'm owning that. And this idea that like you can't own your shit, like grow the fuck up. You did this, you made mistakes, you made people uncomfortable. You've made several people uncomfortable, several. This is, hello, maybe, maybe you're part of the problem. And this idea that you're not, that's such bullshit. Such bullshit. So Daniel, you're saying that Daniel says he's not part of the problem why more women aren't in poker. Correct. Right. And you're saying that he is a huge problem and he is one of the leading reasons. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying he is a huge problem. I'm saying that he has contributed to why there's not more women in poker. His behavior is part of the problem. Mm -hmm. Right? Like there are a lot of people whose behavior or whose complicit behavior is part of the problem, okay? But I'm saying that from me, me personally, there he did say some things that were outrageous, and I know several stories from several people of things that he's done that are that make them very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. and, and you're saying he hasn't apologized, me, he hasn't come out and said, I did that, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna do that again. He basically yeah, saying like, it's, this and is- it's, And then he doesn't have to, he doesn't have to like say like, I'm sorry for every, like, oh, I'm sorry for this. I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry for that. It's like, hey, yeah, maybe I did do some shit that I don't remember doing. Or maybe I did grow, like I was a different person or I was immature. Or I didn't know that these things were taken this way or I didn't mean to, but I realize now how my actions might've made people uncomfortable, right? It's about just looking back and being like, self-aware and reflecting on your past behaviors and owning your shit instead of being delusional and thinking that you're just this perfect person who's never done anything wrong. That's outrageous. And when you are an ambassador, like he's totally ditched this kid poker mentality and has turned into, I, I don't know what this version is. It's outrageous. It's really outrageous. So yeah. Hmm. I used to agree with you before I took a long break. Now I see I see Daniel Negreanu way differently. And obviously what you're talking about, your story is, you know, it makes a lot of sense, right? I'm sure he seems to make a lot of people feel that way. So you're not the first person I've heard say he made them feel uncomfortable. On the other side, he would say, you know, the guy should be able to act how he wants to act. He's a 45 year old man. If he wants to take pictures of himself at the pool or saying or doing things, then he should be able to act and do however he wants yeah, to act. I don't act. care about any of that. It's about, it's about attacking other people. And honestly, I'm not gonna take comments from anyone that's butt shames in the chat. So that I'm just the, the person who's doing that. So I'm not, I'm not engaging in that. What do you so, mean? And what? it's just, it is what it is. <laughs> about what, what do you mean? Uh, I'm just, I'm just gonna leave it at that. You fire, you fire, your, your passion, I love it. I mean, I guess yeah. Ber Berkey in the chat talked about Phil Nagy, I mean, a lot of these, women say the same things about Phil Nagy as well, where Phil Nagy was involved in these incidents with women, or he may have been saying some uncomfortable things, or he may have been uh, sliding in DMs and stuff like that too. So, you know, it sounds like he may have that same sort of impact on women as well in the community too. So I guess- hundred percent. And and the fact of the matter is that I don't have, there's not people around Nagy saying it's okay. Like mm -hmm. the thing is, is like, I've had multiple conversations with Nagy about things that, ha that he said or, or whatever, and I am I go hard in the paint, period. Everybody that knows me has seen me in any kind of interaction with Nagy, with anyone, like I don't hold back. I'm that part, like anyone is gonna get the same amount. Like I'm like, that's not okay. You don't do, right? And just because I still work for a company, it's like, do we want progress? The At, at the end of the day, right, for me, like, in order for more women to be in poker, it's not about telling the men to shut up and sit down. It's about working with the men. Like, and men, 
people are allowed to make mistakes and are allowed to get better. And like, this isn't, I don't believe in cancel culture. I never have, because if so, I would have been canceled years ago, period, right? Like I'm allowed to grow and make mistakes and people shouldn't be afraid to make mistakes. And I'm not saying that like sexual harassment is a mistake. I'm just saying that like people are allowed to grow and do better when they're called out, how they react to that being called out is very kind of representative of how they move forward, right? And and that's the difference. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess a lot of people are just saying that you're advocating, I mean, you're advocating for Phil Nagy and if Phil Nagy has been treating- I'm not advocating, treating... first of all, I'm not advocating for Phil Nagy. I'm advocating for owning your shit and, and growing. That's what I'm advocating I mean, you're doing both, for. it sounds, I mean, you are basically advocating for Phil Nagy, right? You're advocating for, for, I don't know. I mean, I don't see how a different how you can say a different way. You, could, you you're literally doing both. just asked me, and I said that I am I'm a big no, believer I, in progress. No, I agree. I so, agree. Okay, so so basically, the difference between Negranu and Phil Nagy is Phil Nagy is. I mean, that's just what the, the people in the chat want to wonder, right? They're wondering the difference between yeah. the two. It sounds like the kind of guys. It sounds like both of the guys are doing the same kind of thing to me. They're making people uncomfortable. They're putting people in situations. They're being bullies. They're what treating I'm people a certain kind of with, way. With Daniel Granu is he has a platform. And he's literally like, when he gets called out, he just, instead of saying like, oh, maybe I could have done X, Y, Z, mm -hmm. he just attacks and, and is a bully. Right. Whereas I'm pretty sure Nagy did not do that via social media. Yeah. Regardless of what people think of how he responded or they're not happy with X, Y, Z. And I'm not, I don't know all the ins and outs, so I'm not speaking on it and I'm not defending anything. I'm just saying that I have never held back and giving him a full piece of my mind about this situation, about any of the situations that have come up, and I will never stop doing that. I will give every single person, when I see them doing something wrong, I'm gonna call them the fuck out, period. That's it. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, whether I love you, whether I respect you, whether I, I, whether I don't want anything to do with you, when I see something wrong from me, it's up to me to say something. I'm not just gonna be like, oh, I'm just gonna let this die down and pretend it didn't happen. Yeah, I mean, it's I mean, it's really important that, you know, the people in the community who have the influence on these certain people who maybe are doing these kind of activities in the community, they speak up and say something. So when you're close to Phil Nagy working with ACR now from this tournament, and uh, I think a lot of people said maybe, you know, hopefully he does get better, hopefully he does own his stuff, hopefully you're able to make that impact on him. And I guess going back, when you're talking about Daniel Negreanu, with this guy, I mean, it doesn't seem like this guy has any interest in really shifting the kind of personality or the person he's going to become. So you know, I, what, what are you advising for him? Is, I guess. Yeah. The thing, the thing is, is like what he, what he's doing when I, like he's discrediting women, whenever he's like, that didn't happen. She's, she's crazy. She's X, Y, Z, you know? And it's just like, what are you doing? Yeah. What are you actually doing? You know? And like, he's obsessed. He really thinks he's like some, like he thinks he's the Johnny Depp of poker. Like he's obsessed with Johnny Depp right now. And he's just is like, <laughs> everybody is like making up these stories. Like, it's just, it's ridiculous. It's uh, ridiculous. I love it. You're passionate. People in the chat say, me and Abby, this, this is me having a normal conversation. We always get fired up about things. <laughs> I think people always say, oh, they got to agree on things. I'm like, my favorite, my favorite conversations, like everyone got different viewpoints, right? So just because somebody got a different viewpoint than me, I think people like think if you got a different viewpoint, they don't like each other, but everybody has different, different opinions on things. So. Yeah, if I if I only had people in my life that agreed with everything that I said, I would literally just be in like a tunnel, like an echo chamber of like my only way of thinking. And that's not how you grow and that's not how you get challenged and, and get better and learn. And and to be honest, like comparing the two is I understand why people go there and that's fine. And just because I'm allowed to be upset about this thing that happened to me personally, and I'm also allowed to call out the people that I think do something wrong, that are also in my life personally and professionally. And I can do both. And I do do both. Mm -hmm. Period. Okay. Amen. I love the passion. I love the fire. Love the energy. I'm interested to see what you're going to do next with it, Ebony. Interesting. Yeah, my favorite. My favorite is when... Um, People like you get fired up and people say, oh, you're fired up. I get fired up and I have a temper. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's how it works. I mean, 
So yeah, the double standards, the lower. Well, I mean, if you're always, if you're fired up for ten years straight, then people are just going to think you're fired up. So say that again. I said if you are fired up for ten years straight all the time, when people see and hear from you, then 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 uh, they're going to call you fired up. Like I'm always fired up like this, so I'm always pretty pretty excited about these kind of topics and ideas. So. Uh, I mean, yeah, but you you have like you fluctuate with the way that you like you speak and you know even things that you're passionate about. Yeah. Oh yeah, I know. I mean, I, I love how I love how serious you're taking your advocacy for poker and for leading women in poker. I think the community needs leaders like that to put themselves out there to uh, uh, write, say uncomfortable things, to take unhappy positions amongst other people sometimes, right? Because that's how things get changed. And in poker, we've seen that things really haven't changed much in some areas in a long time. But I feel like a lot of that is shifting. We got a new crop of ambassadors who uh, seem like a lot of good people in, in these next generation ambassadors. We got new people making the games. We got new people coming out with events. So I feel like there is a big evolution happening and more people like yourselves are starting to speak out about the issues and there's starting to be more real traction in terms of the way women are treated in poker and the way other people are treated in poker. So overall, I feel like things are getting better, but what would you yeah. say from being in the mix and, and, and kind of seeing it from your angle? So I, I will say that the thing the thing that I think is so important is that people in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. Like that's a real thing, right? Like unless you've lived an absolutely perfect, flawless life and you've never treated another man bad in your life, it is outrageous to just be like, oh, like in, in living by this, what about this? What about that? What about this? Like when I bring something up and then people, instead of like, focusing on what I'm saying and saying like, oh, that's valid. People immediately jump to, well, what about this? You know? And it's just like, whenever I say like, okay, I'm in pain, this caused me some discomfort. And people are like, oh my God, but my mom's in pain. What about her? And it's just like, what? We weren't even talking about this, mm -hmm. you know? So I think, I think for me, um, the thing is, is like, I recognize how I've contributed to some negativity and poker before uh before i started to become like before i started to heal and really work on who i am um so with that i'm really just working to make it a better place for women to feel supported and i think it does start with um people who have the platforms creating opportunities to speak up and to and to hold spaces for women and marginalized individuals to have more opportunities to really just have a chance to grow and be seen and felt safe and supported. And it's going to take working with the people that have these, like it's going to take, for me, like it's not about like, okay, I have to cancel Daniel Grano. I would love to sit down and have a conversation with him. I'm not opposed to that at all. I, I want him, because for me, the way through, like the way for more women to be involved in poker on, in a successful way is to involve everyone, not just like only the women, not just only the people who believe everything that I believe. It's going to take everyone doing their part and seeing a, a better vision and seeing, you know, like creating a better path for people. That's what it's about. It's not about like, oh, you're canceled, fuck you, don't like you. This isn't, this is not the way to grow the game of poker and create a better environment for women. It's just not. Hmm. Okay. So your thesis is more women should be playing poker and, and because other people aren't treating them well, then that needs to stop. People need to treat them better at the poker tables. And you're going to be the one of the people who leads that change and becomes one of those voices who not only educates the men, but also women in why that's important and how to go upon doing that as a solution. Versus how it's, it's been in the past where it's been pretty, uh, you know, misogynistic in terms of the way women are treated, in terms of the general attitude at the poker table. You know, poker's a pretty out of line game. Live poker games are pretty out of line people, so. What, who is this, per ha ha is he a mod? Who? Dark Angel. Uh, I don't know. Can we, can we, do you have a mod in the chat? Yeah, I got them on the is chat. They're they're working. I don't know this chat. This chat's crazy, bro. I don't know what these what the chat's like. Talking people about. are wild. Yeah, 
Everybody got their own opinion. Ebony, listen, everyone's got an opinion. You know, what makes your opinion more more valuable? That's what I always say. Like, who gives a fuck what I got to say what? about these okay. things, right? Okay. Like, why? Joey, why? Joey, Joey, we, uh -huh. can't, we can't, like, have comments like, women need to stop being bitches and fighting each other. And then you say, like, everyone's got their own opinion. Okay. That's exactly why the poker environment is as toxic as it is right now, because we allow comments like this to live. And we just which, downplay which, which it as comment? an opinion. Which comment? The women need we, to stop? You said women need to, women need to stop being bitches and in fighting and support each, each and every one of the women playing like uh -huh. why why does he need to use this kind of language that's a woman that's a, that's another woman that's another woman why does she need to use this kind of language and it doesn't matter why does she need to use this kind of language it should this kind of comment shouldn't live from a woman especially like it's, so it's people shouldn't be allowed to say certain things if if people disagree no, with it what what i'm saying is that it calling people names shouldn't just be dismissed as having an opinion. That's still attacking, that's still bullying, that's still outrageous behavior. Mm -hmm. What's outrageous? So, Certain words are outrageous. Joey, no, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to. I'm trying to really understand what you're saying, right? I mean, a lot, I hear a lot of people say this on Twitter all the time, and you, I, 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 I let anybody people, say whatever they want to say. People, yeah, but when you allow people in your community to just call women bitches, mm -hmm. it creates a mindset that is toxic, and, and facilitates this exact kind of behavior which is exactly why like in my like my twitch community this mm -hmm. kind of language is is like we call each other like we're the bad bitch army i use all the curse words everyone's allowed to curse as much as they want but what i don't allow is people to call other people names and like call people like bitches and whatever in the way like with their intention behind it and so like you really do kind of like dictate how you're like what level of toxicity you allow in your community mm -hmm. And, and that's all I'm saying is like, people like, this is like part of the like, you also have a responsibility, you are a content creator. And when you allow this kind of language to happen, it's like, at what, at what, uh, like, what's the cutoff, right? Like, if someone drops the N word, like, you're probably going to, you know, probably going to delete that, but it's mm -hmm. okay to call women bitches. Like, I don't know, where, where do we draw the line? Yeah, I guess that's a good point, right? Everybody got their own opinion on things. So I'm not that about that censoring that hard. I used to be maybe more about censoring everybody. And and, and if people disagree with me, cut them off. But at the same time, like, not, I, I'm, I'm way censoring. different now about that. I don't, I don't, I don't, actually, I don't agree with it's that about, level of censorship about anymore. censoring people. For me, it's not about censoring people. For me, it's like, hey, like my Twitch community, right? Like when I'm streaming, Twitch is my home, right? So if you come in my home and you're going to be disrespectful to people that I care about, I'm you are you can either play by the rules or you can leave mm -hmm. right that's just the way and it's just like hey i'm not going to allow this type of language because i don't speak about people that way in this house and when you allow people to do that you're saying hey it's okay that you can talk about people this way in this house mm -hmm. that's all i'm saying so yeah you allow you allow some bad behavior in your house mm -hmm. i mean i guess who considers it bad right i mean everyone all right i mean that's how i think about these things so i i guess i, I wouldn't like it if people were trying to tell me what I can and can't say or can and can't do in that kind of situation. So when I look at that and say, okay, do I want to start telling people what they can and can't say in the past, I may have thought more that that was a good idea, but I don't, I don't necessarily agree that way anymore, but obviously these are our channels. So we're allowed to operate that I mean, however way, please. Yeah, for sure. But when you like, when we ask like why more women don't play poker, I mean, this is also part of the problem, Joey. Yeah. It makes sense. I mean, that uh, you have you have the you have one of the loudest voices in poker. No, I'm, re I'm retired. This, I'm retired. I don't have I don't have one of the loudest. You voices still in poker have anymore. you still have one of the loudest voices in poker, and you allow this this type of this type of you know. Oh, it, another it does, woman to say the word another. So another woman to say the word bitches in the chat while I'm talking with you and me. Okay. Allowing that you said I I allowed that lady to do this. That's what you're implying. Okay. Right, because that's not only I don't think that'd be true. So we yeah. got the mods working hard. This chat's out of line, bro. Listen, I mean, the, the chat on YouTube, people are crazy on YouTube, right? So I don't know where these guys come from, <laughs> but I understand what you're saying, right? You as the leader of the community, you do. I'm not do. the leader of the community. No, I'm saying, but, no, I'm saying, but my community, right? I'm leading my community. So I need to be able to dictate what people say. And you're saying it's that if I allow them to say to certain dictate. things, then that's it's not a- not needing to dictate. Okay, so for example, like, ninja allows people to like say the n-word in his chat mm -hmm. like he's okay with this kind of shit and he's just like oh i can't help what people say but you can't help what stays on your in your chat sure yeah you can't you're not you're not controlling what people say but you're allowing to like you're just like hey i'm not cool with this 
lingering on my in my channel yeah yeah it makes a sense. Difference. i like it okay i see what you're saying i see what you're saying shout out to my mod my own mod my own mod another woman got 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 it in trouble they got it in trouble we'll see i don't know I mean, if, you, if someone this, if so, if someone disagrees idea, with that thought, right? Idea, if somebody disagrees with that, Joey, what what do you this think? Idea, listen, this idea okay. that it's okay to call women bitches, like that, like it doesn't matter who says it. Right. Well, I know I like, agree with that, right? If someone says bitch, if someone's calling people bitches in the chat, you're probably gonna get rid of that comment. I would agree with that. But I don't know that lady. The lady's fire up. See, Dan, what? she got me in trouble like that. <laughs> More censorship's better, I understand. That's my takeaway. Everything, everything matters. Every word people say matters. And if people are spreading a certain message and you allow, I mean, it's kind of like that with shilling, right? Promoting, you're associated with these words. You're associated with these phrases. You're associated with the sayings that people are saying and the message that are putting out there as well. Wait, so, we're comparing shilling to just like allowing Well, I'm saying me, right? For me, for about... me, exactly. I, that's, that's what I would say. I would say if I'm promoting this kind of behavior, then that's the kind of behavior I'm promoting in my chat if I'm letting people in the chat use it. Okay. Would you? I guess that's that makes wild. sense. This is a wild reach. What do you mean? No, I mean, that kind of come back to that, but I'm basically promoting that kind of language in the chat is what you're saying by allowing it to take place. So I'm just trying to understand it better. It makes a lot of sense, but I'm just trying to, to get to that point. So, but yeah, guys, Berkey started with the chat. Yeah, I don't know what he said, so. Not sure what it was, but we'll have to talk more about it later. But yeah, can they say bad bitches? I don't think you guys can say that either. Do we gotta, should we block those guys too? All right, I'm going to go, Joey. Yeah, okay. Guys in the chat, we're going to take off. I'll see you later. We're going to take this offline, talk more about it. Peace out, guys.